All right, guys, welcome back. I'm your friend in Saxo. Take it easy. Today, we are going to learn something new about the unity and the machine learning. And to be honest, what we are going to do is to combine all of them together. Let's get started. The first one is the introduction. Hey, I'm Adam Kelly, and I'll be your instructor for this course. I'm an experienced software developer with about five years of experience in Unity, and I've been using Unity ML Agent since the early beta days. My wife and I run a company called Immersive Limit, where we create tutorials and courses about 3D development and artificial intelligence. We focus pretty heavily on creating ML Agents content for ImmersiveLimit.com and the Immersive Limit YouTube channel, and we even created a Udemy course on ML Agents. After seeing our work on the subject, Unity asked us to create a new course specifically specifically for the Unity Learn platform. And now that version 1.0 of ML Agents has officially been released, we are excited to present this new course on ML Agent Hummingbirds. First, an overview of what ML Agents is. The Unity Machine Learning Agents Toolkit, ML Agents, is an open source project that enables games and simulations to serve as environments for training intelligent agents. Agents can be trained using reinforcement learning, imitation learning, neuro evolution, or other machine learning methods through a simple to use Python on API. Well, at the first, I must say, this guy really speaks a really good English, you know? It's very clear and it's very easy for us to understand what he was talking about. So that was quite nice as a tutorial to watch. Now, we're only going to scratch the surface of what's possible with Unity ML Agents in this course, and that's because reinforcement learning and deep learning are such broad topics that it would take months to study all of the fundamentals and try and create something from scratch. The good news is that Unity ML Agents makes it super easy. They actually provide all of the reinforcement learning algorithms so that you don't need to write anything from scratch. And you can just focus on crafting your 3D environment and your agent. If you're interested in some of the more advanced features of Unity ML Agents and to see everything that it can do, check out the official documentation. And there should be a link to that in this course, but you can also find that on the official Unity ML Agents GitHub page. Yeah, it's very good. Let's get into the next one. Traditionally, game AI is done by programming specific rules and states. For example, there might be an enemy in your scene, he'll be patrolling, and then he spots the player and switches into attack mode. So that's a state and then behavior specific to that state. Navigation around the environment is done with pathfinding algorithms, and no matter how complex the behavior gets, it's ultimately going to be governed by human-designed rules. Machine learning is different. So if we're talking about an enemy, rather than designing rules ourselves as the human programmer, we create a neural network or an artificial brain, and that brain is trained in an environment. So the enemy will be called an agent. Basically, whatever is learning in your scene is called an agent. And then there's an environment, which in Unity is contained in a scene. So we have a bunch of different things in the environment that the agent can interact with. And then as it interacts, it gets rewards. And as it gets rewards, it learns that certain behaviors result in different rewards. It has to observe the world so that it can have any sense of what's going on. And we're going to craft all of these observations and the reward logic, and then allow this agent to use reinforcement learning to learn how to update its neural network and then eventually get the maximum reward. In this project, we're going to teach hummingbirds to drink nectar from flowers. If we were using traditional game AI, we would need to use a 3D pathfinding algorithm, calculate a smooth flight path, move the hummingbird along a path to a flower, then orient the bird so that it is in front of the flower, also facing the flower, and and then move so that the beak is inside. So this is a fairly difficult task to program. ML Agents allows us to design a learning environment and reward for good behavior. Then through training, the hummingbird will learn how to do all of this without any behavior rules programmed by us. The first thing you need to decide when you're building a new ML Agent is how it's going to learn and interact with the world. So if we're doing hummingbirds, then we need to think about how the hummingbird is going to fly and how it's going to interact with the environment. So we could take the path of trying to do some really advanced flight mechanics with wind dynamics and fluid simulation and all this, but that's probably overkill and uh, we'll spend more time designing the physics system than we will with actually designing the ML agent. So that's no good. So we're going to simplify flight quite a bit and we're just going to give it some basic controls. Hummingbirds in general can move in any direction. So we're going to allow the agent to pick a direction to move and then it's also going to 
be able to turn to its left and right as well as pitch up and down. So in more technical terms, it's going to learn to pick a 3D velocity vector and manipulate pitch and yaw. We'll give it a fairly simple problem, and that's going to be that there are a lot of flowers around in the environment, and they're all full of nectar. And if it manages to get its beak into one of those flowers, after a couple of seconds of drinking the nectar, the flower is going to be empty, and then the hummingbird will need to move on and find another flower. There will be some basic stationary obstacles in the environment, like some rocks and bushes and a tree, but that's it. No other complicating factors to make this more difficult. Before we continue, I just wanted to give a quick side note, and this is for anyone who has their own project in mind and is thinking that they're going to follow along with the hummingbirds and apply it to something fairly different, some other project. I'm going to recommend that you don't do that because ML Agents is really complex. Just for context, it took me over a month to get the hummingbirds working the way I wanted them to, and that's after I I'd already done several projects. I've been working on ML Agents for a couple of years now. Every time you take on a new project, there are new challenges. And if you don't have a firm understanding of some of the basics and, and the gotchas that happen with ML Agents, you can get really frustrated. So with that, my recommendation is stick with this course, do the hummingbirds and get them working. And then when you start your own project, start with something really simple. Make sure that you understand how to get the simplest agent working. Because if you start with something super complicated, chances are it's not going to work and you won't know why. So that's my recommendation. Um, absolutely hope that you take this forward beyond this course and customize it and do all sorts of cool projects. But while you're getting started, while you're first learning, just I would recommend sticking with these with this course and not going too far off the beaten path. Yeah, so we are going to know the hormone burden projects. Once you've decided what the agent is going to learn, you need to decide what it will observe about the world. This project was originally going to be a camera vision agent, like the bird could actually see the world with a camera, but that turned out to be way too complicated. So I didn't think that that would be a great project to teach. I thought it would be better to keep it a little bit simpler. So fortunately, ruling out vision still leaves us with lots of options. We can observe positions, we can observe rotations, velocities, even raycasts. And if you're not familiar with what a raycast is, it basically shoots out a, a ray or a line from a point and then sees if it hits anything. So it's kind of like a laser pointer. Uh, it can report back what it sees. Now it's time for your first challenge in this course. What sorts of observations would you give the hummingbird with the restriction that you can't use camera vision? I want you to write down your thoughts. And after you've come up with some ideas, I'll show you what I picked for the project. And then we'll stick with that for the rest of the course. Once we're done with the course, I would suggest that you go back to that list and experiment. It could be that you have an idea that works better than the version that we teach in the course. And that's awesome. Um, so it can be really fun to experiment, but also you might find that that turned out not to be something that helps very much at all, or even something that just makes it take way longer to train or something like that. So go ahead. I will also provide the challenge in a text format so you can read that and follow along. And when you're done, we'll come back in the next video and talk about what observations we're going to use. Yeah, let's go on. The observations is just like what uh, we could receive from those environments so that we could make some de decision. All right, hopefully you came up with some creative ideas. This is what we'll be observing in this project. First, the agent's current rotation. So that's going to be a quaternion, which if you're not familiar with quaternions is just Unity's way of representing rotations. Second, the direction to the nearest flower. So we're gonna cheat a little bit. We're going to tell the agent where the nearest flower is. It doesn't really have a sense of any of the other flowers in the environment. It really only knows about the one. So it's kind of unrealistic, but that's the simple version of this problem. We're also going to tell it, number three, the distance to the nearest flower. Number four, how close the agent's beak is to pointing at the flower. So it's going to be helpful if the agent knows whether it's pointing at the flower or not. If it's pointed in the wrong direction, it doesn't matter what it, what it does, it's not going to succeed. Number five, how close the agent's beak is to being in front of the flower. So it might be pointing at the flower, but if it's not in front of the flower, then that's not very helpful. And then finally, we're going to have several raycasts that act like LIDAR so that the agent 
and can avoid obstacles. So it's not going to use these to see the flowers at all. It's just going to use it to see the obstacles. So like rocks and bushes and the tree and the ground uh, and the boundaries. So it's going to have a sense of where it is in space or how far away it is from things, but it's not going to use that to see the flowers. Now let's talk about rewards. So when a hummingbird wakes up in a new round of training, it has no prior experience. It has to learn everything from scratch. So that means even though it might be observing a flower, it doesn't know what a flower is or that the flower has anything to do with a reward or anything else. So it's just going to take random actions. Now if we reward it properly, then eventually it's going to start associating observations that are related to drinking nectar with getting rewards. So we can reward it positive or we can reward it negative. So if it does something bad, we'll give it a negative reward or sort of a punishment. If it does something good, then we want to give it a positive reward. And there are lots of ways that we can do this. You could think of it from a very fine grain level. You give it a tiny reward every time it moves a little bit closer to a flower, or you could give it a reward when it successfully drinks the nectar from 10 flowers. There's different ways you can do it. And generally, though, either of those extremes is probably not a good idea. And just a little something I want you to think about. So let's say you rewarded it in that extreme case of any time it moved toward a flower. Would you punish it because it's moving away from another flower? So there's, it's kind of a hard one to think about. And, uh, you know, you can be forgiven for not really knowing what to do at this point. But I do want you to just do your best to think about how you might want to reward the hummingbird to avoid crashing into things and to successfully drink from nectar. I guess that's not that difficult at all. For example, if that, uh, if that bird, hummingbird, getting more and more close to the flower, that's a positive reward. And on the contrary, if he's approaching to some other obstacles closer, then we will give it a negative reward. This challenge may have been a little bit harder because in practice, it takes a lot of guessing and experimenting and just seeing what works with rewards. You know, you don't want to get too complicated, but you also don't want to go so simple that it can't actually learn anything. So uh, I, hopefully you came up with some cool ideas for your rewards. Uh, let's talk about what we're going to use in this project. One, we're going to give a small positive reward for each time step if the bird's beak is touching the nectar. So when I say time step, think of that as like a fraction of a second. So for each fraction of a second that the bird speak is inside the nectar, we're going to give a small positive reward as long as there's nectar remaining in the flower. Second, we're going to give a fairly large negative reward for hitting the ground or the boundaries of the training area. There's going to be a ceiling and walls and a ground, and if it hits any of those, we want to give it a negative reward so that it learns to stay within the boundaries. And that's it. We're actually not going to make it any more complicated than that. In my experience, if you try and make it too complicated and you try and sort of teach it to do something intelligent by rewarding it little bits for one thing and another thing, it gets kind of difficult to make sure that the rewards are balanced. And so it tends to be better to just go with simpler rewards like this. Now that you have a good idea of what Unity ML Agents is and what we're going to be doing in this Hummingbird project, including how we're going to observe the environment and reward the agent, it's about time to get started with this project. So make sure that you have a recent version of Unity installed. I recommend 2019.3 or higher. And then also make sure you have all the resources downloaded. There's some source code and asset files that you can download that are attached to this course. Once you're ready, move on to the next section and we'll get started creating the project. So here we got a few files. We need to download it. With the field downloaded, as we could know, the homing board scene contains a Unity package right in here. And the source code, it contains some scripts. They even call the, the C sharp programming language or source code the scripts. But it's not a script, it's a compilable stuff. Anyway, let's get into the next one. In this video, we're going to set up a new Unity project and import assets. So the first thing you should do is open up Unity Hub and make sure that you're on the more recent versions of Unity. I'm using 2019.3 and you probably want to use .3 or newer because the UI got a refresh and it looks a little different. Then you're going to want to select the universal render pipeline and then make sure you've got a location set where you want this to go and we can call this project hummingbirds 
and then click create. And while this is setting up, you should make sure that you have the assets downloaded for this course. So right now I have the Hummingbird Scene 1.0 Unity package that will have the assets that you need to import into this project. This could take a little while, so make sure that your scene is not only open, but things look correct. You might have some things happening down at the bottom, like baking and all that. I would recommend that you allow that to finish before you start working with the project, because otherwise you're going to have some weird artifacts. Like you could have, you could see that I had some weird like blue colors and things. It should go fairly quickly, but depending on your computer, it could possibly take a little bit longer. Once you have your project set up ready, um, there's a lot of stuff in here that we don't really need. So, I mean, the first thing that I tend to do is just remove this tutorial info and read me because this is going to show up every time you open your project. You can select these two and delete them and at least that won't show up. There are example assets and an example scene in here. You can delete these as well if you want, but don't do it yet because you can't delete the scene until you've added a new scene. So what I'm gonna do is find the Unity package that I downloaded for this project, and you can drag it down into the assets directory. And then it should show up this import Unity package dialog, and it's gonna have a list of checkboxes for all the things that can be imported. There should be some materials and some some meshes and then some prefabs a scene called training and some textures so we're just going to click import and that should import all of our assets under this new hummingbird folder now at this point if you'd like to clear out your other assets you can go into the scenes training open this up and then you can come back out here and the example assets you should be able to delete because that's all the construction scene as well as the scenes there's just that one scene in there you can delete that whole folder and then that's probably pretty Pretty good um, everything else that's in here that's a skybox material there's some presets and settings and stuff um, you can leave all that then let's take a quick look inside of here just to get a little bit familiar with what's going on so this first thing that you'll notice is that in this training scene we have this sort of floating island and it has a bunch of flowers and bushes and rocks and a tree in the center what you might not see until you hit the game tab is that there's a little hummingbird in here and we can see it in the game tab because the main camera over here is is, uh, looking at this bird so uh, if you expand this right here and you click on the hummingbird and then hit the F key to zoom in you'll be able to see this little hummingbird so the scale of this is very small and before we go in and talk about everything else that's in this uh, scene I want to do something that is going to help us because our bird is so small so we need to go into the project settings and there's a chance that you still you already have this open but in case you don't have project settings open it's under edit project settings and then that should open up this tab and if it's floating in space like if it's floating like this you can always drag it and put it over here you can go to the physics selection here and then default contact offset so specifies distance which the collision detection system uses to generate collision contacts the value must be positive and it's set if set too close to zero it can cause jitter so this one right here it's set to one centimeter so that's um, a little bit too much for this bird you can see how how, how small he is. Let's see if I can get close to him again. You can see this little beak. This beak is going to need to go into the flower. And if we did one centimeter, then there's a chance that the contact offset uh, detection for physics won't work properly. And so I've found that if I just set this to 0.001, that's one millimeter, then collisions inside of this project work quite a bit better. So I think this is the last thing we'll work on in this video. We'll talk about some more of what's going on in this scene in the next video. All right, now let's do it by ourselves. We're going to open the Unity Hole. Then what I'm going to do is to collect the new project. Let's go to the All Templates. From there, we're going to use the uh, 3D Simple Scene URP, the Universal Render Pipeline. Here we do not use the HDRP since it's um, it's used for some more advanced stuff, something like a fraction movie. It can look very real, but that's not what we are going to use. We are going to make some more unrealistic unre scene by using this one. Yeah, I'm going to call it the ML Bird, then hit the Create Project button. Now after I after we have opened this project, we could uh, let's say do some importing. First, I'm going to delete the README file. We right click it, and here we get the delete button. So I'm going to delete the tutorial information. 
after that, we go to the configuration. Oh, sorry. We go to the homing board scene. From there, we got the Unity package. We're going to import it. Yeah, how can we do that here from the assert? Let's say we got the import package. So I will just pack the package that we have. Pick the package. Then import everything that we need. After that, we shall get a new folder called Hummingboard. I'm going to delete all the useless stuff. All right, now I'm going to go into the Hummingboard folder. From there, we got the scenes. And there, we got a training. I'm going to open it. Here we go, we got the scene. Yeah, after that, we're going to focus on the birds that we have. I'm going to press the F button. Now, we say we got a little bird right in here. And to be honest, I was quite love the you know the operations that we can have to navigate the Unity scene. It's quite smooth and easy to navigation. So I'm going to go to the project setting. From there, I'm going to collect the physics. And here we got a default contact offset. I'm going to add a zero to it. Now we probably have everything set it up. Let's go back to the tutorial. In this video, we're going to talk about what is inside of this scene. So we're going to go back to the inspector tab here so that we can see things. And we can talk about the hummingbird first. So the hummingbird is just a small 3D set of 3D meshes. So we've got a body and two eyes and wings and a beak tip. The beak tip is not actually a mesh, it's just a transform in space that will help us detect when the beak tip is inside of the flower. So we will be adding scripts to this, but to make things easier, I've already attached a set of colliders on this. So these three colliders that you see, the three or the two spheres and the one capsule are here. And these are just preset so that they're in the right space, they're, uh, they're the right size, and they will not move at all while the bird is flying. Flying. It's just kind of a rigid shape. This is basically just the right size so that it can fit inside of these flowers. And let me see if I can zoom in on one of these flowers. So you can see that there's the petals and then inside of the petals, there's this little center area. This is where the bird is going to try and put its beak. Now the lighting in here doesn't look that great right now, but we can actually fix this in the lighting tab. If you don't have the lighting tab open, you can go to window rendering lighting settings and then then we can generate lighting and then it should fairly quickly look better. It doesn't look a lot better to me. Uh, perhaps the skybox material, I think that might be the problem. Oops, let's go back out to assets and then go to materials and then we can drag this in here and that looks better already. Not sure. Ah, yes. So regenerate the lighting after you have your skybox material uh, put in there and then things should lighten up quite a bit. Okay, so let's continue on. We'll talk about what's underneath this floating island here. So the floating island comprises of a of the island grass, which is this green shape right here, island dirt, which is underneath here. You're never going to modify these or anything. They're just kind of there for show. Um, then we have the island boundaries. So the boundaries are the physical component of what keeps the bird inside of here. Now, it may look like it's just a six-sided cylinder here, uh, but actually it's inverted, meaning that the faces point inward. The uh, Let's go to the inspector. There's no mesh render on it. I've removed that so you can't see it but the mesh collider has all its faces facing inward and that will prevent the hummingbird from leaving this space. Then we have our tree and we have a path of rocks. So these are pretty much just for looking good. I'm going to skip over flowers for just a sec and show you the bushes and the rocks. So the idea with these is if you'd like to customize where these are, they're they're built in clusters and you're welcome to move these around and customize them as you like. I'm going to undo that. Um, um, you can add more flowers, add less flowers, add more rocks, all that. That's the idea of this. It's it's very customizable in that sense. So let's look at the flowers. The flower is made up of a bunch of these flower clusters. So I'm going to try and zoom in on a flower cluster here. And then under here, there's a bunch of flower plants. So a flower plant contains multiple flowers. And I'm just going to open this prefab. If you click on this little thing right here, it'll open the prefab of the flower, which I'll also mention is under hummingbird prefabs. So all of these are in here. And the idea of this is that a flower plant has multiple flower buds on it. Okay. And 
Um, we'll be talking more about all of these, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview of everything that's going on inside of this scene that we're going to be working with. So this is going to be our training scene, and then eventually once we have things fully trained, we'll create a new scene that will be the gameplay scene when we turn this into a little playable mini game. Yeah, sounds interesting. Now we got a virtual world. In this video, we're going to install the ML Agents package and set up our scripts. So you'll need to go to the Package Manager, which is under Window, Package Manager, and then we'll need to find ML Agents in here. Now, if you don't see it in its alphabetical order place here, you'll probably need to go into Advanced and Show Preview Packages. At some point, this will be out of preview and then it should show up in the main list, but for now, it should only show up as ML Agents as a preview package. Once you're seeing this here, then then you can install it. The version that I'm using right here is 1.0.0. This could be updated by the time that you see it, and if it's had any major updates, there could be some changes to how the code works, but hopefully it's similar enough and you'll be able to follow along with the rest of the course. So when you're ready, you can click install, and if you have any questions about what's changed since the latest version or uh, anything about this, then you can click on these links here for the documentation and the change log. Now, when you see that it is completed, it should say up to date here in this little button area. So you can close the package manager. And then if you want to see the code for ML agents now, you can open up the packages folder here in the project tab. And if you scroll down, you'll find this ML agents folder. And this is where all of the code will go for uh, where ML agents is. We're going to write a few classes and one of them is going to inherit from this agent class. So when we talk about that later, this is where that is if, in case you want to look at it. So the next thing we'll do is go back into our assets folder and go into the hummingbird folder Folder, and we're going to create a new folder called scripts. And then inside of this folder, we're going to create the three scripts that we'll be working with for the next part of this course. The first one, you right click, create C sharp script flower, hit enter, and that will create flower.cs. We're going to create another one, C sharp script flower, and then capital A for area, flower area.cs. And then finally, we're going to create a C sharp script called hummingbird agent. So now we have hummingbirdagent.cs. And you can open up this in Visual Studio by double clicking on it and it will it should open up Visual Studio. It may take a moment if you haven't if you didn't already have it open like I did. And if you don't have Visual Studio, you don't absolutely need it, but it does help a lot for your things like autocomplete and telling you when you have something wrong. So just be aware that throughout this course I'll be using a lot of the advanced features. Well, I won't say advanced, but a lot of the advanced autocorrect and autocomplete things that come in uh, while we're programming and you'll see me doing that. So just know that it is a big advantage to have Visual Studio installed and that Visual Studio Community Edition is completely free. So if you don't have it, you can get it. Uh, it even comes in included in the install for Unity unless you check the box for some reason to say no. And at this point, we should be ready to start coding. All right, so according to his advice, now we should go to here and create a new folder called Scraps. And after that, inside of that folder, we need to create a few C sharp scraps. The first one is a flower. Yeah, then another one is called flower area. The third one I'm going to call it a humming bird. Now if we double click one of the scraps, we got that file opened in MACVIN, which is wrong. We should change the executive order. I mean, we should choose what kind of software we want to open. We want the IDE to be used to open that file. And clearly, we want to use a Visual Studio. But for some reason, it didn't just pop up. So we need to find out where's, where's the problem. It says that it cannot launch the Visual Studio. This application requires mom or newer. Please download it. Then we will do the downloading. 
Right now, let's install this framework. Well, it's so frustrating that we need to do something like this to install this one. All right, it's been installed successfully. Let's go on. What we are going to do is to open the Virtual Studio. And if you have noticed that here, it got a number 2019. Yeah, right in here, 2019. So even if for now it's 2021, this ID still do not get updated. That's too bad. Now, let me try to open one of the scripts that we have. Here we got our scripts, and I'm going to open this one. Well, it just stuck in here, as you could say. It's not a good uh, thing to say. And if you look at this, you would start to notice that we got an error. Virtual Studio, Virtual Studio not responding. That was too bad. That's too bad. So what I'm going to do is to force stop it. There is another problem. I don't know why this is always in the process. So I'm going to try to open this whole project again. See if we can make it work. All right, nothing really changes. So now I'll try to open the Virtual Studio again and click the open table. Then we would be able to do some choosing. I'm going to choose this one, but we couldn't open it for some reason. You know what? I think something needs needs to be done and I'm going to fan it out. Oh, here we go. From the references, here we got the external tools. Here we got the external scrap editor. I'm going to choose the virtual studio. And here we got a few operations to choose. But for now, I'll just uh, Collect the regenerate project files because we don't have it yet. After we generated all of that, let's go back to our scripts. For now, we got no scripts available yet. So I'm going to get into, okay, here, I'm going to double click the flower scripts. For now, it will say this application wants to access the Virtual Studio application. Do we allow it or not? I'm going to say, okay, but then, um, It just starts in here, doing nothing. So I'm going to force close the Unity. And I'm going to double click this file again. Yeah, of course, we still got an arrow. That, that makes sense. We're going to go back to the external toe. Again, I'm going to choose the Visual Studio and generate all those files. After that, I'm going to save this project. And I'll try to double click this file again. And then it starts in here. If we go to this um, monitor and we do that checking again, you would say that is the Visual Studio is not responding. Uh, it's not response. So I feel pretty sorry for this computer because it really got a lot of problem even with the Unity. So I probably have will have no other choice but rebuild this computer to say if it will work or not. All right, after the re rebuild of my computer, now let me open the Unity again. And that is the beginning. I just want to make sure that we have successfully selected the Virtual Studio or MSA. If that's correct, now I'm going to double click one of the scraps that we have. And then we say, indeed, the Virtual Studio is opened. But that's not enough. We need to actually to save the files. But again, I'm stuck in here. That was too bad. I start to think what I really could do to be able to make it work. Well, maybe the two applications, they are just the, do not have the desk access for my computer. So I'll give each one of them the full desk access. I'll even give the Unity the permission because I totally trust it. Now, let me try to double click this again. For now, we could be able to open the script without any problem. So indeed, this, this machine of mine or the MSA system installed on this computer, it has some problems with that, with the permission kind of stuff. Whenever an application asks for the access for some folder, no matter how I click those buttons, it will not disappear. So it, it will it will not work. So that's probably that's probably a bug a bug for this uh, 
um, system for this operation system. So fuck it. I don't know why I get this, but fuck it. It it wastes a lot of my time. All right. After the Virtual Studio set it up, we need to install the ML agent, which means we have to go to the package manager right in here. Then I'm going to head the Unity registry. From there, we could say we got the ML agent. Then I'm going to install it. All right. After that, let's get into the next part. In this video, we're going to start and talk about the flower script. So the first thing I'm going to have you do is just add a short comment at the top. So three slashes will bring up that summary tag. And we're going to say manages a single flower with nectar. And in case you're curious, the difference between just a comment like this with two slashes and one with three that has the summary, if you hover over something that has that three, you'll notice that it shows that text that's in there. So this is just a helpful way of when you hover over something, you can get information about it. I generally use it for anything that's public. And then we can delete the start and update functions that are inside here. We'll be filling in our own functions. But let's talk about what this flower is for. So we're going to attach the flower to our flower inside of the flower bud prefab. I don't want you to do it yet, but I just wanted to show you where this is going to go. So it's going to be attached to the flower. The flower, if I hide the gizmos here, the flower is just this red part and then everything underneath it is um, other stuff. So like these pistols are a, a child object of the flower. The flower itself has a mesh renderer and then there's materials on that mesh renderer. Well, just one material and that's this red flower materials. So the idea here is we're going to use this flower. We're going to have a collider on it, which I'm going to turn the gizmos back on. This collider here this is a solid collider so that when the bird runs into it it can't go through it it also has sort of a, a pit in it or like a it's kind of like a trumpet shape almost so it can fit its beak inside of here it can it can go inside but it can't get in from this from the outside from underneath so that's the idea here with this shape it's more it's not as complicated as uh, the flower itself but it does allow for uh, the behavior we're looking for and that's just a normal mesh collider now the flower nectar collider is different this one is not solid it's a trigger so a trigger is different it calls when you collide when any sort of object collides with a trigger it gets information about that will be able to override a function called on trigger enter and will know when the bird's beak has touched inside of this trigger and so that's the idea is we'll have the solid flower we'll have the the non-solid trigger in inside here that represents touching the nectar of the flower and we're going to use this script to manage this this thing as well as how much nectar is in the flower and also once the flower is completely empty of nectar we're going to turn the color of the flower from this red color to a more purplish blue so that's the idea with this script and in the next video we will start actually working on this script in this video, we're going to start filling in our flower class, and we're going to start with some public variables. So when I do public variables, I like to add a tooltip first, and the tooltip is going to describe what this thing is for when you hover over it in the inspector. So we're going to say the color when the flower is full. So this will be a public color, full flower color equals new color and we're just gonna define this color's RGB values, the red, green, and blue, 1F, 0F, 0.3F. And this is that sort of reddish pink color. Uh, you can see it's almost all red, a full value of one, uh, but, or it is all, all red, but then it also has some blue mixed in. So that's, that's sort of that pinkish color. Then we'd like to add another one for the empty flower color, but I'm just gonna copy this and save a little bit of typing. And we're gonna change this to the color when the flower is empty. And we're gonna rename it to empty flower color and then we need to change the values the values we're going to use for this are 0.5 so a half value of red and then a full value of blue so this is more of a purple color so now we've got two different colors it's going to swap between these two colors when we empty out the flower or refill it then we're going to need a public collider nectar collider and this is whoops 
Uh, this is going to be a public because we need to access it outside of this class, but we don't actually want to be able to modify it from the inspector. So there's a tag that you can do in square brackets called hide in inspector, and that will make sure that you can't see it in the inspector. We'll add a comment to it. This one will be three slashes because we're going to be accessing it externally. And this is the trigger collider representing the nectar. The next one's going to be a normal private uh, private variable, so we'll just do a simpler comment here. And this one will be the solid collider representing the flower petals. And it's going to be private collider flower collider. And the last variable that we need here is the flowers material, and this will be a private material flower material. So we're going to fill these in automatically. So we're going to automatically find the nectar collider and the flower collider, and then also the flowers material. So let's move on to a couple of accessors that we're going to be using. So the first one is public vector three flower up vector. And this one is going to be a, we'll add a comment that says a vector pointing straight out of the flower. And so the idea here is that the agent, the hummingbird, is going to observe the up vector of the flower, which is, if you look at this, it's basically this Y axis right here that's pointing up so that even if this is rotated in a different direction, it'll show us which direction is basically out of the flower. So it's able to have some idea of the orientation of the flower. So for this, we're only going to need a get. And then in curly braces, we're going to say return nectar collider dot transform dot up the next one is going to be a public vector three flower center position and this is very similar whoops i didn't mean that uh semicolon there so we need curly braces i'm going to add a comment here that says the center position of the nectar collider so this same idea we're going to need to observe this about a flower and that's its center position so we're going to return inside of the getter nectar collider dot transform dot position so now we have these this is going to make it easier for us to observe the flower in the future we have two more accessors and they're pretty straightforward the first one is a public float nectar amount and this will we're going to use the shorthand for this so get colon or semicolon private set. And this just essentially makes it something we can access externally, but we can only set this value internally inside of this flower class. So we're going to say the amount of nectar remaining in the flower. And then finally, we're going to have something, it's just a little helper that says public, or it's called public bool has nectar. And the idea here is we just want to check to see, well, I'll just write it, get return nectar amount is greater than zero F. So all this does is it tells us whether the flower has any nectar remaining. So the idea here is we, we keep track of how much nectar this flower has left in it. And then we have this little getter that just tells us whether there's any nectar left. So we could, we could also just check this anytime we're using this, but has nectar just makes it a little, mo little bit more clear what we're doing. So that's it for this video. We're going to, in the next video, work on the functions for this class. All right, um, you know what? I think those programming stuff, it's kind of easy and it's sometimes um, it's kind of boring to write all this basic stuff, you know? So I just skip it since since he already gave us uh, the code that he was using. For example, this one, flower.cs. He already gave us all those codes, so we don't have to write it manually again. In this video, we're going to write our first function in the flower class. And this function is going to be called public float feed float amount. So you'll see here, this is called feed. It's taking in a parameter called amount. So that's the amount that the hummingbird is trying to feed from this flower. So the idea is we'll pass in a value. It's trying to take like 1% of the flower's nectar. And then it's going to attempt to remove that from the feed or from with the feed function. And then it's going to return how much it successfully took out because it's possible that the flower doesn't have enough for it to take from. So the, so the comment for this is going to be attempts to remove nectar 
from the flower. And the amount is the amount of nectar to remove, and it returns the actual amount successfully removed. So inside of here, we need to do a few things. The first thing we'll do is track how much nectar was successfully taken. And in parentheses, we'll just say cannot take more than is available. So that may be obvious, but we need to just make sure that we don't accidentally go negative in the in the nectar. So we'll say float nectar taken equals mathf.clamp. And we're going to clamp this amount between 0f, so that it's never negative, and nectar amount. So that's the, math, the maximum amount of nectar that's remaining in this flower. Next, we're going to subtract the nectar. So we're gonna remove it. So we have this nectar amount. This is how much is in the flower. We're gonna say nectar amount minus equals amount. So that's gonna update that nectar amount with uh, less nectar in it based on the amount we're taking. Then we're going to say if nectar amount is less than or equal to zero, now we could use that has nectar thing, but I think it, this just makes it a little clearer what we're doing since we're directly modifying it right here. We're going to say, in this case, there's no nectar remaining. So we just wanna be extra careful and say nectar amount equals zero. Then we will say disable the flower and nectar colliders. So this is just going to make things a little easier for our hummingbird. This is a particularly difficult challenge for the ML agent to solve uh, based on my experiments. And I found it helped quite a bit if the flowers just kind of vanished. They, they don't actually go away. You can still see them, but their colliders will disappear. And that just makes the problem a little bit simpler for the hummingbird to solve. He doesn't get caught up on flowers or like stuck between two flowers. And it just, it seems to help quite a bit. So we'll say flower collider dot game object dot set active false. So this is gonna deactivate the flower collider so that it can't even run into it anymore. And then also nectar collider.gameobject.setActive false. So this just makes the both of these things go away. We'll bring them back when we reset the flower. Next, we're going to change the flower color to indicate that it is empty. And for that, we'll have to say flower material dot set color and here you want to pass in the name ID. And the name ID is based on the shader that it's using. And the shader that we're using is the, the basic shader that uh, Unity uses. And the parameter that we need to change is underscore base color. And make sure you get your underscore in there and your capitalization and spelling right um, because it's specific. It won't work properly unless this matches properly. And then we're going to set the color to our empty flower color. The last thing we need to do is after this if lock, we're going to return the amount of nectar that was taken. So we'll say flower material, sorry, we'll say return nectar taken. So that's just going to take that amount that we calculated at the top and return it. So now that the hummingbird has successfully fed from the flower, it's going to be told how much it actually got from the flower. So that's it for the feed function. In the next video, we'll move on to the reset flower function, which is going to basically fill the flower back up and turn these colliders back on, reset the color. All of that are basic operations in programming. So actually the game programming it's quite easy for any who for anyone who have already mastered the programming languages. For example, me. In this video, we're going to work on the reset function, and we're going to call this public void reset flower. And the comment for it will be resets the flower. And I'm going to mention something because I made this mistake when I first uh, wrote this code. I wanted to call it just public void reset. And I didn't realize that reset is a special unity function that gets called automatically at certain points. And so I started getting some weird behavior that I weird error messages really that I didn't like. And so I had to rename this to reset flower. So I just wanted to mention that um, in case you come across this in the future, that if you just call something reset, then there the editor will automatically call reset in certain circumstances and you can get undesired results. So reset flower is pretty straightforward. We're basically just undoing everything that we did here. So we're going to say refill the, the nectar 
So we're going to say nectar amount equals one F. Then we want to enable the flower and nectar colliders. So just to save a little bit of time, I'm going to copy these and paste them down and set both of these to true. And in Visual Studio, if you hold down the Alt key and click, you can actually edit multiple lines simultaneously. So I'm going to set this to true. And then we want to change the flower color to indicate that it is full. And we are going to copy this line up here from the set color. I'll paste it down here. We're going to set the base color again. And instead of empty flower color, we're going to set it to full flower color. So that's it for reset flower. Now that we have this, you know, being automatically set to an empty, uh, empty flower, we need some way to reset all these. And that's what this function's for. So in the next video, we're going to do our last function of this class, and that is the awake function. So we'll set up a couple things right when the flower wakes up in the scene. In this video, we're going to wrap up the flower class with one last function and that is private void awake and this will have a comment called called when the flower wakes up and the first thing we're going to do is find the flowers mesh renderer and get the main material so the mesh renderer if you're not familiar, let's see if I can pull this up. Unity's going a little slow here. Okay. The mesh renderer is on the flower itself. Anything that has visible mesh to it has a mesh renderer on it. And this one here on the flower has a material flower petals. So that's this red color that's on here. So we're getting this material by checking the mesh renderer's material. So the way we do that is mesh renderer, and we'll call it mesh renderer equals get component mesh renderer. So it's going to find that mesh renderer component. And then once we have it, we want to set flower material equal to mesh renderer dot material. Since there's only one material on this mesh renderer, we can safely just say dot material. And then we want to find flower and nectar colliders because we've been using them here, but we haven't set them yet. So we want to say flower collider equals transform so that's the parent transform of this flower dot find and we're going to find so this finds a child um, and we are going to pass in its name so here in unity there are hold on this is going slow again okay here there are two children we need to find this flower collider and flower nectar collider so we need to make sure that we spell these correctly and then it's going to be able to find these for us automatically so we're going to first find flower collider. So I'm sure that capitalization and spelling and everything are very important. So make sure you get this right. Dot get component collider. And this will definitely cause an error if, if you don't, uh, if this doesn't work or if there's a missing object or if it's named something different in the scene, this obviously won't work. So you'll get an error message, but that's not a bad thing. You want an error message when things are wrong. So um, we're not doing any extra checking right now to make sure that this is not null or anything like that. And then the other one we want is nectar collider equals transform dot find. And this one's going to be flower nectar collider and we want to do dot get component collider and that's it. So that wraps up the flower class. We have this helpful class that's going to be attached to the flower itself. You'll be able to customize the colors. You'll be able to, uh, or you won't have to do anything with the nectar collider or flower collider. They'll automatically be set up as well as the material. And then you have these options to get the flower up vector, the flower center position, how much nectar's in it, and then you can feed from it. So, oh, and of course you can reset it. Uh, so after maybe if I do this programming, it will take probably one hour or something like that. We we just finished one scrapped or um, one the one code file that was too slow. In this video, we're going to start working on the flower area script, and I'm going to add a comment at the top to describe what it is. It manages a collection of flower plants and attached flowers and we can clean this out and let's talk about what this does so in the project you have a flower bud we've been looking at that we also have a flower plant okay and a flower plant just has three flower buds on it okay and the idea with a flower plant here is that it's going to have a tag on it up here 
flower plant. Now don't actually change this yet in your project. I'm just doing it for demonstration purposes and we'll get to this later. And we're going to find these flower plants so that we can modify them slightly. The idea is when they're in the scene, like this, they're going to be scattered all around. And to add some randomness to, the, to that scene, what we're going to do is rotate them around their around the stem axis so they can be kind of turned in any direction. And we'll also rotate them slightly um, on their x and y axis. So rather than do that here, I'm just going to show you really quick what that would look like here. So if I switch into rotation mode, um, the idea is we could spin it any direction around here. We're going to do that randomly and uh, then you can also like tilt them a little bit this way or that so if you look this is about five degrees over here that's what we're going to do in either direction along the x and the z axis so that's what we we will be doing inside this flower area as well as some just general housekeeping to make sure that we reset all the flowers um, and make sure that the scene is clean and ready to go for the training round that is about to happen yeah Let's go on. In this video, we're going to set up our variables that we have at the top of this class. And the first one is going to be the diameter of the area where the agent and flowers can be used, sorry, can be used <laughs> for observing relative distance from agent to flower. And this is going to be public const, so it's a constant, float area diameter equals 20f. All right, so first let's talk about what this is. If you look at the island prefab, we have this big island and there are flowers that can be scattered anywhere on it. The area diameter is essentially the distance from one side of the island to the other. If we had larger spaces to play in, we would probably want to set this to a higher value, but because we're only training on a, uh, an island that's 20 meters across, we can set it to 20 because that's the maximum value that the hummingbird can ever be from anything else on this little island. Now the reason you want this to be equal to the maximum distance that you can be from something is because we're trying to keep that number, that observation of the distance of something from the hummingbird to less than one or at most one. The neural network works better if you have sort of a, a percentage or a fractional number versus a number that gets really high. If you had say this number go up all the way from zero to 20, then that number that gets passed in is a very high number instead of in that range of zero to one, which seems to be a pretty good sweet spot for neural networks. After we have that, we're gonna add the list of all flower plants in this, in this flower area. And flower plants have multiple flowers. So you saw that, you saw the flower plant that had three different flowers on it. So we wanna keep track of these, but these are just game objects. They're not, they're not actually flowers. So this is going to be private list game object flower plants. Okay, so flower plants is just a simple list of, of flower plants and we can use that later when we're sort of randomizing the environment. The next one is a lookup dictionary for looking up a flower from a nectar collider. Okay, this will be private dictionary collider is the key and flower is the value. Nectar flower dictionary is what we'll call it. And just to explain what this is, what it's for. So when the bird is flying around in the scene, it's going to eventually, hopefully, assuming the training is working, it's going to collide with its beak into one of these flowers. And if we look inside one of these flowers, so it's gonna hit inside here, it's gonna hit this nectar collider, which is going to have a nectar tag on it. And the, when we, we're gonna do a test basically, when the bird collides with any Anything, we're going to test does it have a nectar tag if it does have a nectar tag then we're going to have to look up what flower that nectar collider belongs to and so to do that easily we're going to keep a lookup dictionary for any collider any nectar collider that's in the game so that we can say okay well which flower does that nectar collider belong to that's what this is for and then the last thing we're going to add in this video is a public list flower flowers. And this one is effectively just going to be a variable that we can access from outside, but only set inside of this class. So this is just going to have a get and a private set. Okay, so what that means is we can set this list, we can modify this list inside of this flower area class, but when the hummingbird tries to access this list, it can only get the flowers. 
and this will be the list of all flowers in the flower area. So that wraps up all of our accessors and variables that we need, and in the next video, we'll start working on our first functions. In this video, we're gonna work on four different functions. One that's going to reset an individual flower. One that's going to allow us to look up what flower belongs to which nectar collider. Another one that is what happens when the flower area wakes up. And then the last one is when the game actually starts. So let's start with that reset flowers function. Public void reset flowers. The idea here is that we've, we want to set random rotations for each flower plant and then also reset the flowers themselves. So we're going to say reset flowers and flower plants. And then what we're going to do inside of this function, first thing is rotate each flower plant around the y axis and subtly around, whoops, subtly around x and z. So we need to loop through all the flower plants for each game object flower plant in flower plants. So this is that private list of flower plants that we have. We need to generate three random variables, three rotations, one for the X, one for the Y, and one for the Z, and then we'll set the rotation. So we'll need some placeholders. So float X rotation equals, and then we want to generate a random number between negative five degrees and positive five degrees. So to do that, we're going to use a the unity engine dot random uh, class dot range. And this may be different from uh, if you if you just do random, uh, sometimes it doesn't know the difference between unity engine dot random and system dot random, which is why we put that unity engine in there. And range allows us to put in a minimum value negative five F and then positive 5f. And that is our randomly chosen rotation around the x-axis. Now I'm going to copy this to save on some typing. I'm going to paste it two more times, and we're going to do this for y. And for y, we want this to be from negative 180 to 180, so a full 360 degrees of possible rotation around the y-axis. And that's the up-down axis, by the way. And then the z rotation is also going to be negative 5 to positive 5. So we should have a, a slight randomization for each flower at this point. And then we'll just say flower plus plant dot transform dot local rotation equals quaternion dot Euler X rotation Y rotation Z rotation and the what this does basically it, it's it returns a rotation here it says it right there it returns a rotation that rotates Z degrees around the Z axis X degrees around the X axis and Y degrees around the Y axis applied in that order okay so that's that's what this is doing and sets the local rotation next we're going to reset each flower and to do that we'll need a for each loop for each flower flower in flowers we'll just call flower dot reset flower and this is that function that we defined in the flower.cs class that's going to reset everything that the flower has changed at any given point after this we'll need another function so this is outside of the reset flowers function and we're going to call this one public flower get flower from nectar and it's going to take in a collider called collider the idea here is this is going to access our lookup dictionary for nectars and flowers. We haven't set this yet, but the idea is you'll be able to ask this function which flower belongs to which nectar collider, because the bird will touch its beak to a nectar collider, but it won't know which flower it's attached to necessarily. So this is just a function that helps it do that. So we'll add a comment that says gets the C, a function called pro. We're going to add some functionality here. It's going to find all flowers that are children of this game object slash transform. Now, I was originally going to add this functionality in the awake function flowers. Ah, uh, oh my God, too boring, too boring, too boring. I just want to get into the agent kind of stuff because that's the only thing that I ever care about. I just want to use the Python to do the machine learning. That's all. Why it has to be so complicated? I mean. I have to go through all those process for making a game. Does that make sense? Let's get into the, you know, really important part. 
In this video, we're going to start working on Hummingbird Agent. This is going to be a pretty long class. There's going to be a lot of code in it, and it actually inherits from a class that has even more code in it. So I'm going to try and explain everything as we go slowly and make sure that everything makes sense. First, let's add a comment, a Hummingbird Machine Learning Agent. That's what ML Agents stands for. So the idea here is this is going to be a special class that makes decisions using neural networks. So this Hummingbird Agent will inherit from a class called Agent. And as this suggests, this is part of the Unity.MLAgents uh, namespace. And of course, if you, uh, for some reason, don't have the uh, ML Agents package installed in your project, then this won't show up at all. So make sure you follow that instruction step. So if you click on that, then hopefully it added this using statement. If it didn't, for some reason, you're seeing a red squiggly line underneath, make sure you add this using Unity.MLAgents. And we'll clean out these two functions as well so that we have a clean class to start from. Now, agent is a very interesting class, and I'm just going to open it briefly and show you. So I'm going to right click and go to definition. So this is a very long class. Um, so you can see that it's about, okay, a little over a thousand lines of code. And for you to go through and understand everything that's happening in here would be kind of a lot. Um, so I wouldn't recommend doing that right now. But I will point out, I happen to land right where I wanted to talk, uh, we're going to override some functionality that's inside of this class. If you're not super familiar with how C Sharp overrides work, or you know maybe you're a, a newer coder, uh, basically the idea here is that this class, which we are inheriting a bunch of functionality from, has defined these sort of empty placeholder functions by saying it's a virtual function. They are saying you can override this function, and we will call this function, but you can override it, and whatever you put in your version of the function is going to be called when we call it. So they will, in their code, call initialize automatically for us, and then we will define our own function that has uh, functionality in there. So just to show you, you can right click on this and you can go to, or find all references, and then down at the bottom, let me pull this up a little bit, it'll show all of the places where this initialize is called. And most of these are in comments, so let's look here. So initialize is called inside this agent class, inside of this function called lazy initialize okay and let's just back out a little bit further uh, you can click on this one reference or you can right click and find all references again and this is called inside of on enable so basically I'm not going to keep going but you could follow this path to see where things are being called from and you end up getting a good picture of how these functions are automatically called and there's a few others that we're going to go through but that's the idea is we have to add this functionality to our own hummingbird agent that does things things when, for example, the agent is initialized, when a new episode begins, when uh, there's no neural network attached. We're going to, I'll talk about all these in detail. I don't want to do it all now, um, but just know that that's coming. And most of what we do inside of this class is to support overriding those functions that come from agent.cs. So in the next video, we'll start actually writing some code. Yeah, that's cool. In this video, we're going to start adding some variables to the top of our class, and we'll start with public variables. And as we did before with our public variables, we're going to add tooltips to describe what these things do. So we'll add a tooltip, and the hint will say force to apply when moving. Okay, so this first one is going to be public float move force equals 2f. So the idea is that the bird is moving in some direction. How much do we apply or how much force do we apply in that direction? Next one will say speed to pitch up or down. Public float pitch speed equals 100f. And then the next one is tooltip speed to rotate around the up axis. Public float yaw speed equals 100f. Okay, so these first three, they're just going to have default values. They'll allow you to change how much the pitch and the yaw change when you press the keyboard keys to control it yourself, or you can tweak it for the actual agents themselves. If you're not familiar with pitch and yaw, these are flight terms for uh, how the basically how the bird is going to turn. If you imagine, usually this is for like airplanes and stuff, using pitch, yaw, and roll to rotate around the different axes. So 
just to explain really quick, pitch is like, imagine your head tilts backward to look upward or tilts forward to look downward, that's pitch. And then the yaw is when you turn your head to the right or the left. That's that's like when you're uh, turning around the up axis. So we won't worry about roll, but roll would be if you did like a side flip or something. Uh, you can't actually roll your head very far. You can roll, you know, if you were to touch your ear to your shoulder on either side, that's technically like rolling in terms of pitch, yaw, and roll, but obviously you can't roll your head around completely, I hope. Then the next one we're going to add is another tool tip, and we'll describe it as transform at the tip of the beak. Okay, so this one is going to be transform, oops, sorry, not public transform beak tip. And the idea here is that we need to know where the actual tip of the beak is. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to have on our hummingbird, um, this right here, we have a transform here. I just hit W to switch into the move mode so you could see it better. That is the beak tip. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, I'll explain what that's for later. Then we're going to have a tool tip, the agent's camera, all right? So this one is public camera, agent camera. And this one we won't actually be using inside of this script. We'll be using it later when we convert this or rather transition this into being an actual playable game um, because we're going to turn on and off the camera depending on whether you're the player or whether the neural network is controlling the agent because the neural network isn't going to use the camera, only the human player. Then we're gonna need another one, tool tip whether this is training mode or gameplay mode. I've found this to be helpful to have, let's see, public bool training mode, to have something that we can indicate whether we're training or not. Uh, it's not always necessary, especially if you're not planning on turning this into a game, you're just planning on uh, using this to learn ML agents. But if you are, then having some way to distinguish behavior that only happens during training versus happens when you're playing in the game can be very helpful and, and actually quite essential. So that's it for the public variables. Uh, in the next video, we're gonna go through and add some private ones. Um... Uh, you know what, uh, for this video, what he just said is that he added some public variables inside of that file, inside of that uh, somehow he called it agent. Well, that's probably those uh, variables that uh, Python could access, I don't know. Let's, let's go on. In this video, we're going to add all the private variables that we need. So this first one is going to be a private rigid body, rigid body what we'll call it. Now this is going to be unhappy with us. It's going to say that uh, hummingbird agent dot rigid body hides inherited member component dot rigid body. Use the new keyword if hiding was intended. So the problem here is that Unity used to have a way to quickly look up the rigid body on an, on an object basically and this was the keyword that you used to do it. Well if you try and use this keyword now then it says that you can't use it, that it's deprecated. So we can still use this variable as long as we put a new keyword in front of it, then it's happy. Then we can just say, then we can use this rigid body thing. So don't worry about it too much. We're just gonna use it. Um, this is the rigid body of the agent. Next one is going to be the flower area that the agent is in. So we'll call this private flower area, and then we'll just name it flower area with a lowercase f. Next one is the nearest flower to the agent. Private flower, nearest flower. And we'll be calculating that nearest flower uh, whenever, whenever, basically whenever a flower is empty, we're gonna calculate the next nearest flower so that the bird can find that one. Allows for smoother pitch changes. So this next one is going to be private float smooth pitch change equals zero F. Now when I was working on a previous project uh, with airplanes, I found that if you don't smooth out the changes and the turning and the rotating, then things look really jittery, especially when a neural network is controlling it. So this smooth pitch change, and then we're gonna do also allows for smoother yaw changes. These really help to make the movement look more natural. Smooth yaw change. It's really hard to talk about something else while typing something unrelated. 
so the yeah the smooth pitch change and yaw change these are just values that we're going to be working with you don't really need to spend much time trying to understand how they work as long as you're okay with them just working uh, we'll be addressing them later in the code the next one is going to be the maximum let's see maximum maximum angle that the bird can pitch up or down private const float max pitch angle and we're going to set that to 80 degrees from the uh, from the horizon basically so it, if you think about if you were pitching your head then that's tilting your head back all the way until you can look straight up at the sky or straight up at the ceiling and uh, we're only going to allow it to go up 80 degrees rather than the full 90 degrees and all the way down would be all the way to the floor um, that's going to be 80 degrees as well so that's what this this is for we don't want the bird to be able to flip all the way over and then fly upside down maximum distance let's see make sure i'm doing this right distance from the beak tip to accept nectar collision and this one is private const float beak tip radius equals 0.008 f so the idea with this is the beak tip right here is going to go inside of the nectar collider on the flower and we want to make sure that it is actually inside there so we're going to have a small radius around this that will accept for being a successful collision with the nectar because i guess i'll take a moment to explain this the hummingbird itself has these three colliders on it it has a big sphere for the body a small one for the head and then this sort of uh capsule here um that you can see for the the tip now ideally this is the only thing that goes inside the flower but realistically there's a possibility that maybe the head will go inside um, so what we need to do is we need to make sure that if this bird collides with the, the nectar at all we only accept the uh, that the bird is drinking if the collision happens and the tip of the beak is within this small radius of the nectar so that's that's what we're doing there private oh I skipped the comment let's try this one uh, let's see whether the agent is frozen and that's intentionally not flying private bool frozen equals false now this is another one that's useful when you're converting your uh, your agent into an actual game this thing is always going to make decisions it's always going to be constantly feeding observations into the neural network unless you completely turn it off so one of the ways that uh, seems to work pretty well is if you have an idea of it being frozen meaning yeah it's still observing the environment but at least it's not taking any actions so we'll check to make sure that we're not frozen and if we're frozen then we'll We'll just freeze physics we'll make sure that it's not moving at all and then when we unfreeze it then it will allow it to keep going and the last thing we're going to add here is a public float nectar obtained and this will be a get private private set we'll add a comment here let me scroll down and this is the amount of nectar the agent has obtained this episode so we're going to keep track of how much nectar was obtained and we can use this in the game um, part of it so that we can have two competing hummingbirds and we'll track which one is winning and which one is losing and we'll of course reset this every time the, the game resets so that's it we have all of our variables ready to go and in the next video we'll continue by starting on some of the functions i still didn't say how he gonna interact with the python in this video, we're going to start with our first two functions, and these are going to be override functions. So let's start. Public override void initialize. Now, when I started typing that, as soon as I typed override, it started suggest, or after I press space, I guess, it starts suggesting things that I can override. So these are all the virtual functions that are inside the agent class that I'm able to override. So initialize is the one that I want to override here. And let's add a comment initialize the agent and uh, I'm not gonna add that I had a little extra thing there but basically this this overrides the agent class was what I was gonna say but that's kind of unnecessarily since it says override right there base dot initialize means that if there was any functionality in the base version of initialize we would call it but there's nothing there so there's no reason to keep this line here what we're gonna do here is we're gonna fill up a couple of our variables so rigid body 
equals get component rigid body like this. And this will just find the rigid body component and put it in that variable. Flower area equals get component in parent flower area. So it's assuming that the agent is a direct child of a game object that has the flower area script on it. So that's what's going to happen. We're going to have our island and the, the bird is going to be a direct child of it. So that's how this will work. Then we're going to have one more line in here. If not training mode, no max step, play forever. So the idea here is that we are sometimes going to be playing this game and we don't want to have the the play the gameplay timeout on us automatically. So uh, we'll say if not training mode, max step equals zero. So zero is a short code for a shortcut for just saying infinite uh, in this case. Otherwise, let's say at a max step of a thousand while you were training, um, then you tried to play the game and you wanted it to go on for say five minutes. Well, it would automatically reset after those 1000 steps happened. And that would be long before your five minutes were over. And so that could cause some issues. So that's it for initialize. Pretty straightforward. Next one we're going to add is a public override again and this one we are going to do on episode begin and this one is reset the agent when an episode begins and again we don't need this base so the first thing we'll do we're going to need to do a check if training mode then only reset flowers in training when there is one agent per area we're going to say flower area dot, oops, dot reset flowers. So this is going to happen anytime the air, the area resets, we're going to reset all of our flowers. The reason we're doing this only in training mode is because in the gameplay version of this later in the course, we're going to have two hummingbirds in one area and they would both end up calling flower area dot reset flowers, which doesn't make sense. So instead, other code is going to call reset flowers at the beginning of a competition, so to speak. Next thing we need to do is reset the amount of nectar obtained. Reset nectar obtained nectar obtained equals zero so now we're 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 empty again empty belly then we're going to zero out velocities so that let's see so that movement stops before a new episode begins rigid whoops rigid body dot velocity equals vector three dot zero rigid body dot angular velocity equals vector three dot zero. This is super important when you're working with ML agents because the training mode or when you're training, your hummingbird is going to be moving uh, with force in a direction and possibly turning. And when you reset, then you don't want it to be moving anymore. But the world hasn't actually reset. So even if you change the position of the bird, then it's going to keep moving at the same force that it was. So we don't want that. So it's always a good idea to do this. Then we want to say default to spawning in front of a flower. So the idea here is that sometimes we want the bird to spawn directly in front of and looking at a flower. And other times we don't want it to do that. When we're training, we wanna give it a, enough opportunities to learn when there's ideal conditions and also enough opportunities to learn when it's not ideal conditions. So we're gonna kind of split how much, how often we start in these different positions. So we're gonna do a bool in front of flower equals true so that's we're defaulting to true if training mode then we're going to spawn in front of flower 50 percent of the time during training so we'll say in front of flower equals unity engine dot random dot value so this generates a value between 0 and 1 is greater than 0.5 so that effectively is saying, hey, 50% of the time during training mode, we want to spawn just randomly. And the other 50% of the time we want to spawn in front of a flower. If it's not training mode, if it's gameplay, we always want to start so that the bird is looking at the flower. And that's just helpful for when the player starts playing. It's just, it's a nice instant reward to just fly forward and, and get your beak in a flower. So then we're going to move the agent to a new random position. And we're going to use a function that's not yet defined called move to safe random position. And we're going to pass in in front of flower as our variable. And then we're going to recalculate 
the nearest flower now that the agent has moved. So we've moved, this is going to move this hummingbird agent to a safe random position. The idea with the safe random position is that we wanna make sure that it's not like inside a bush or inside the tree or something like that. So we're just gonna do a quick check before we place it somewhere random. And this one, update nearest flower. Also doesn't exist yet, but the idea is that once you've reset the, the agent and put it in a new place, we want to tell it what the nearest flower is. So that was a that was kind of a lot uh, for these two functions, but in the next video we're going to start, we'll actually define what these functions do, and um, you'll have a better understanding of how we're going to... Uh... Uh, yeah, still boring. I didn't say anything that related to the Python. Hmm... So let's get into this one on action received. Maybe this is a action that coming from the Python script. I don't know. In this video, we're going to start working on a function called on action received. And I'm going to put that above my private functions here. I tend to like to keep my public and private variables at least separated a bit. So after this on episode begin function, I'm going to add a public override. And then we want to look for the on action received right here. And we can remove this base call because it's not going to do anything. And let's add a comment. This is going to be a pretty detailed comment. So we'll talk about it as we go. So first of all, this is called when an action is received from either the player input or the neural network. Neural network. So regardless of whether you're controlling it as the player or whether the neural network is being asked to make decisions automatically, the AI is making the decisions, that list of decisions comes in to this function as a list of float numbers. So there's basically a sort of a code uh, to it, a um, instructions in the form of a list of numbers that tell the agent what to do um, regardless of who's making the decision. So to kind of explain what this means, so vector action at index of i. So this is a list, so we're just at any given index, it means something. So I'm going to say represents. So index 0, so the first index, is going to mean the move vector x. So this is kind of arbitrary. We get to decide which which uh, index does which thing. So don't worry too much about that just yet. We're going to get through and talk about what all these indexes are. We're just going to decide what they do. So the first index is going to represent how much we move in the x direction. So a plus one is going to be is going to mean move to the right. A minus one means move to the left and zero means don't move right or left. Index one is a move vector y, so moving up and down, basically. So plus one equals up, minus one equals down. Index two, move vector z, so this is in the forward backwards, so plus one equals forward, minus one equals backward. So together, these first three indices of the float array are going to comprise the x, y, and z components of the movement that this bird is going to do. Because it can move in any direction, it needs to know how much to move in the x, y, and z. We're also going to have index 3 mean the pitch angle. So in this case, plus 1 equals pitch up, and minus 1 equals pitch down. So this is uh, tilting forward or backward. And then index four is going to be yaw angle. So this is turning left or right. So plus one is going to be turn right, minus one equals turn left. Okay, so what you'll see here, this is basically the description of, of what's happening in this vector action. So I'm just going to add this really quick. The actions to take. Hopefully this makes some sense. What we're going to do is convert these numbers into actual movement in this function. So we'll say when we see a positive one for this, then we want to move in that direction. We're going to want to apply a force in that direction. When we turn, we're going to want to rotate. All right. I know that uh, this is an, this is a list of actions. Yes, it's pretty normal in the machine learning. I know every thing about it, but the problem is how we define those actions. For this function, what, what we need to do instead of the on action received is to 
parse this list of action and convert it into the environment or do those actions in um, inside of that environment. Yeah, that's not so uh, that's not so hard to understand, but the real problem is how can we define those actions? In this video, we're going to work on the contents of on action received. So the fixed updates happen every. All right, still didn't do anything about it. So let's say we got to go to the next one. In this video, we're going to work on the next public override function, and we'll put it right after on action received, and it's going to be public override. And then we want to get the collect observations, not the collect discrete action mask. Make sure you do collect observations, and then you can remove this. And you'll notice that it's not happy about this vector sensor. Well, that's because there's a namespace that needs to be included. So if we click on this, we can do using unity.mlagents.sensors. So now it's happy. Let's add a comment. Collect vector observations from the environment and this is the vector sensor. So the idea with this function is that anytime it's called, it's going to observe the relevant details about the environment that the hummingbird agent needs to make decisions. So it's going to observe, in this function, we're gonna make it observe the rotation of the bird. We're going to observe a vector that points to the nearest flower. We're gonna observe a dot product that basically tells us whether the beak tip is in front of the flower or not so it's helpful to know uh, as the bird whether you are in front of the flower or behind it or to the side we're also going to observe a dot product that indicates whether the beak is pointing at the flower so that's different you might be in front of the flower but you might be pointing away or you might be behind the flower but pointing directly at it so we want to we want to tell it both of those things and then we also want to observe the relative distance from the beak tip to the flower and I say relative because we're going to use the area diameter that we define in the flower area class uh, just to go back here the area diameter is like how wide the island is uh, we're gonna give it that value as well so we're just basically how far the flower is relative to the area so let's get started on this the first thing we'll do is observe the agents local rotation and this is going to be a vector three or sorry I misspoke it's going to be a quaternion it's going to be a rotation and we need to add it to the sensor so sensor has a function on it called add observation and you can add in lots of different kinds of observations here. There's Boolean, which is a true false value. There's float, which is just a number. Int, which is another kind of number. Quaternion, which is four floating point numbers because a quaternion is just a four valued uh, matrix, basically. You multiply vectors by a quaternion to get um, a new vector. So that's four values. And then there's a vector two, which is of course two. Vector three, which is three in X, Y, Z. Uh, and then there's this any sort of enumerable of floats, which is basically like any list of floats you can pass in. So what we're going to do is we're going to pass in transform dot local rotation dot normalized. So this is a rotation in the local space, meaning not in the world space, but the local space relative to the, the island that the hummingbird is on. And it's normalized just to be safe so it's a a quaternion with a magnitude of one so now it's observing this current rotation that it is it doesn't know where it is in the scene but it has at least some sense of whether it's pointing up or down or you know somewhere to the left or right so that that's helpful for it to know what it's doing so we're going to add just a little note here that this is four observations because we're going to need to add these up for for later the next thing we're going to do is get a vector from the beak tip to the nearest flower. So this will be vector three to flower equals nearest flower dot flower center position minus beak tip dot position. Okay, so this is directly from the tip of the beak to the flower. And next we're going to observe a normalized vector pointing to the nearest flower. So for this one, we just say sensor.addObservation2Flower.Normalized. 
And normalized with a vector three means a vector that's only one meter long. So it's purely a direction versus if you calculated this and let's say the flower was five meters away, well, this vector is gonna be five meters long and passing in a five meter long observation vector is just a little bit more complicated than this always being one. So imagine the difference between all of the different possibilities that this would have to learn if the vector could be anywhere from you know two centimeters out to 20 meters first all right it seems like um he do not care what a kind of data um he was going to pass to the sensor variable but instead he just put a lot of uh, data into the sensor he doesn't actually specify which one is which oh that's weird in this video we're going to continue the collect observations function after this last observation we've added with the two flower dot normalized, we're going to add some dot product observations. Observe a dot product that indicates whether the beak tip is in front of the flower. So the idea is here, it'll be helpful for the bird to know whether it, the tip of its beak is in front of the flower or not. If it, it might be behind the flower, well, that's not going to be very uh, productive for getting in. So it might be really close to the center of the flower, but if it's behind the flower, then that's useless to it. And we'll say plus one means that the beak tip is directly in front of the flower. Minus one means directly behind. Now the vector math is a little bit outside of the scope of this uh, course, but if you're curious how a dot product would indicate these things, then you can research dot products and that should help you understand. We're just going to say sensor dot add observation vector three dot dot to flower dot normalized comma negative nearest flower dot flower up vector dot normalized. So these two vectors that we're comparing are the two flower. So that's the obviously from the beak tip to the flower and the negative nearest flower dot flower up vector. So this is the down vector. What this means is we have the, the vector to the flower and the down vector. So into the flower. And when those are aligned, then it's going to give a positive value. So that means that we're in front of the flower. Next, we want to observe a dot product that indicates uh that's interesting so this is kind of you know related to the linear algebra so as you, as you know when you facing the flower to flower is a vector that uh that indicate the direction of the bird and the flower especially yeah something like that then um the nearest flower and the flower up vector the negative version of that um okay that means that means a direction that uh, get into that flower so if the two variable if the two matrix or vector if we dot it or calculate the production of it and if if and if it's equal to a positive one then that means that that two direction they are actually in the same direction or they are similar or um yeah um horizontal or uh, let's say parallel with each other so this is kind of you know the the power of math you have to know this to be able to you know code like this whether the beak is pointing toward the flower and in this case plus one means that the beak is pointing directly at the flower negative one means directly away. So this one is very similar actually um, in how we calculate it. Sensor.add observation, vector three dot dot. Um, but in this case we say beak tip dot forward dot normalize. So this is the forward vector coming out of the beak tip. And then we pass in negative nearest flower dot flower up vector dot normalized. So the difference here is that in this case, we get a positive number when the beak is pointing directly at the flower, um, but this one tells us whether we're in front of the flower or not. And then we have one more observation to add. Um, before I do, I'm just going to say this is a float. It's a single float, so it's actually one observation. And this one's the same, it's another observation. Okay, so this last one that we need to add, observe the relative distance from the beak tip to the flower. And this one's also going to be one observation, so I'm just going to paste that in. Sensor.addObservation, 
and this one is going to be two flower dot magnitude. So this is the length of that vector divided by flower area dot area diameter. So this, in our case, is going to be a value of 20. So we're dividing the distance to the flower by 20, and that is the observation we're adding. So then the total number of observations for this whole thing are 4 plus 3, so 7, plus 1 is 8, plus 1 is 9, plus 1 is 10. So we will just say 10 total observations. And we're going to need to know this later when we hook things up um, with our hummingbird agent. So after everything was recorded and we were going through the course, we realized there was a potential case where nearest flower would not be set before collect observations was called. It's not necessarily going to happen every time, but it could happen. So we want to do something to make sure that in that case, we don't try and access it because you'll get, you'll end up getting error messages for trying to use the nearest flower here and here and here. We also don't want to not observe anything. It would be better to observe all zeros until that nearest flower is set. And because it's only going to be doing that for like a single step update, then it doesn't really matter if we show it zeros for that microsecond of time. So the quick solution that we came up with was we have this check at the top of the function. If nearest flower equals equals null, then we're going to do a sensor dot add observation and we're going to pass in a new array of floats that's 10 long. All right, that's enough, but I still do not see any Python code. Was that normal? I don't know. So let's get into the last one. In this video, we're going to start working on the heuristic function. So this one goes right after collect observations. It's a public override, and this should be our last public override. Heuristic, and we'll add a comment to this. We'll say when behavior, oops, behavior type is set to heuristic only on the agent's behavior parameters, this function, will be called. Its return values will be fed into, and I'm going to do a C, C ref. This just will uh, make it more clear what's going on. On action received float, instead of using the neural network. I can't remember if I taught this before or not. Forgive me if this is repetitive. The uh, This CC ref thing, when you hover over this, it makes this a clickable thing. Uh, so it's the same, same thing up there. Then the actions out, in this case, is um, an output action array. So heuristic, in this context, is some sort of algorithmic decision that's being made, made instead of a neural network making the decision. I have an extra space there. So what we're basically doing is we are creating a list of actions that will be passed into on action received in any circumstance where we don't have a neural network hooked up. So this could be something that purely decides, like automatically decides, okay, we know where the uh, nearest flower is, just move the bird toward the flower and turn the beak toward the flower and do that automatically. But the alternative and what we're going to do is to take input from the user so or from the player so this is what's going to be used anytime there's a player playing the game or when we're testing the game um, we're going to take keyboard input and I know that keyboard input is really not ideal for flying um, a hummingbird because I've tried it and I'll admit that it's a little awkward but it's the best we have because um, we can't count on everyone who's going through this course to have a controller that they could hook up for example but what we're gonna do is we're gonna control this hummingbird using the W, A, S, and D keys on the key. If you want to replace this with your own. All right, in this video, we're going to work on the code that goes inside of the heuristic function. So the first thing we will do is create placeholders for all movement slash turning. So we're going to need a vector three forward and we'll default that to vector 3.0. We need a vector three left. We need a vector three up. So we'll default to not moving at all in any of these directions. And then we need a float to keep track of the pitch and a float for yaw. So by default, we don't do anything. Now we need to get keyboard input and convert that into values. Convert 
keyboard inputs to movement and turning. All values should forward to be left equals negative. Next one is pitch up slash. So just take a moment, double check, make sure that all of these values are the right of zero equals combined dot x. Whoa, that was not what I wanted. Actions out. There we go. And we're putting them all into this array that we got from up here. And then those values, if we're in heuristic mode, will be passed in. Uh, so basically this this mode, what, what is the heuristic mode does is to um, is to take some actions when the neural network does not work. Yeah, by doing so, probably we could, uh, let's say, use the human input as the training data for the neural network. In this video, we're going to handle freezing and unfreezing the agent. Now, these aren't truly ML agent specific. They just help us, as I mentioned earlier, to make sure that the agent isn't doing anything, isn't taking any actions when we don't want it to. And we're doing this first just because these are also public functions, and we're just going to do it before our first private function here. Public void freeze agent. Let's add a comment. Prevent the agent from moving and taking actions. And we're going to do an assert first. Debug dot assert training mode equals equals false. Freeze slash unfreeze not supported in training. So we're just doing this quick check here to make sure that we're not in training mode because we don't support freezing in training mode. It will cause weird things to happen. This will be just for when we're doing gameplay later. We're going to say frozen equals true rigid body dot sleep. So this turns off physics for a little bit and it also freezes the agent so that we can keep track of it. We're going to do basically the same thing to unfreeze. So I'm just going to copy this whole thing and I'm going to unfreeze and we're going to in this one we're going to say resume agent movement and actions and we want to still do this assert in this case we're going to set frozen equal to false and we're going to say rigid body dot wake up so that's the freezing and unfreezing logic we'll be using that later in the course uh what we need is that function the freeze and un unfreeze kind of stuff i don't know in this video, we're going to write the code that handles when the agent collides with things. There's two different cases. It's going to collide with something in the environment, or it's going to collide with a trigger, the nectar trigger. So it's either there are boundaries, there are bushes, there's trees, there's the ground. There's also the flowers, and inside is that little nectar trigger. So we want to handle those collisions differently. And so we're going to go down into our private functions. I'm going to actually go underneath this update nearest flower, and we're going to add a private void on trigger enter. And it's going to suggest this because this is a special unity function that's called automatically when your agent's collider enters a trigger. And that collider that it enters is called other. So what we're going to do here, we'll add a comment here called when the agent's collider enters a trigger collider and other is the trigger collider. And all we're going to do inside here, we're, in a, we're actually going to call another function that we haven't yet written, but we're going to trigger enter or stay. We're going to pass in other. Oh shit, it's quite boring what he was doing. What he was doing. Can I just do the work immediately? <laughs> you know, I don't want to know those um those tedious stuff. I don't think that's a thing that really matters. So, uh, let's go on. In this video, we're going to start setting up our Hummingbird agent. So you can double click on this Hummingbird prefab. And just to recap of what's going on with this bird. So it has these different objects here. These are just the main body of it and the, the meshes that you can see. Then there's this invisible beak tip transform that's here. And then we've got the Hummingbird uh, main object here, which has the rigid body as well as uh, the different sphere colliders and the capsule collider. So this is how it collides with the world. So the first thing we're going to do is add a new component and we're going to find the hummingbird agent script and attach that. Now this will automatically attach a behavior parameters script as well because this is a required component for the base agent class. And I guess I'll just show you that really quick. So in hummingbird agent 
if I go to here and I click go to definition, then you'll see at the top of the agent class, it's like it's hidden, uh, it has this require component type of behavior parameters. So that is, um, that's why that shows up there. That behavior parameters thing shows up. All right, so in behavior parameters, we're going to start by giving this a name, this behavior name, and we're gonna call it hummingbird. And make sure that you spell this just like I am and that the capitalization is the same because we're going to have to match this to another place in a configuration file. So I'll tell you about that, where we're matching it to uh, when we get there. But just know that it's, it's important that this is spelled correctly and exactly the same, that you don't customize this. Then we need to decide how many vector observations to add. So this vector observation space size actually corresponds to, let me close this, I don't need the agent class, the Hummingbird agent. And and if we go to the, let's see, not on action, where am I looking? Oh, okay, I had to scroll up. Okay, collect observations. The collect observations function is where we observe we, and put things into a vector sensor. So this is the number that we need to fill in there. So we have this 10 total observations that we calculated earlier. That's the number that goes in right here, 10. Stacked vectors, we would be doing this if we wanted to know the observations from the past several updates. Um, in this case, if you just set it to one, it will just do the current observation. It doesn't do multiple. So if we had set this to three, then we would actually be getting 30 values total. You wouldn't update this number, but it multiplies this number by one, by whatever this number is down here to give you a many more observations, but those are actually the last couple updates. Vector action, space type. So there's two options here. We have discrete and we have continuous. We're using continuous. Continuous means that the agent, or rather the neural network that is uh, making decisions on behalf of the agent, is choosing a number between negative one and positive one. And that could be negative 0.5, positive 0.6, zero, any, anywhere in between there um, with any amount of precision that it wants. So that's what continuous means. And just to continue with explaining this, we're going to set the space size to five because there are five different values that we're trying to set. And that corresponds to our on action received. These index zero, one, two, three, four. So that's the, the five different decisions that are being made and converted into um, the different movements. We don't have to configure what they're for. The cool thing about the neural network is that when it's trained, it just experiments and figures out what works best in a given situation. So you don't have to tell it that the first three are the movement vector. It will figure that out automatically. And then the rest of these, we're just gonna leave as they are. So there's no model yet. This will be filled in once we've trained the agent. We'll have a model to drop in here. Um, you should not expect to have a model when you start out un until you train the agent. And what a model is basically a neural network, if you've ever seen that uh, sort of a graph of a neural network, you've got lots of dots and lots of lines crossing over each other, kind of like a spider web. Uh, that is a visual representation of a neural network. And each one of those dots has a value associated with it. This is kind of a, a storage mechanism for those values that are stored. It's it's the trained weights, if you're familiar with other uh, neural network nomenclature. Then we have the inference device. Uh, I've actually only ever experimented with CPU, um, so we're going to keep that there. Behavior type, default, we want the team ID to be zero. We're not doing teams in this uh, game. And then use child sensors, make sure that this is checked on. So that's it for this video. We're going to continue on with Hummingbird Agent uh, in the next video. So finally, we are getting into the core part of the whole video series. We are finally are going to train the agent. In this video, we're going to continue setting up the Hummingbird agent. So in the Hummingbird agent area, we have something called max step. And we're going to set this to 5,000. And this means that the agent will take 5,000 steps before it is reset automatically. So this happens during training. We don't want it to train indefinitely. We want it to be trained for some amount of time and then we'll reset it so that it has a fresh start to uh, learn from a good starting point. When we're playing this long term, we actually automatically set this to zero in our code. Um, but for now, it's it's gonna be 5,000. Then these should be the defaults, move force, pitch speed, yaw speed. Don't experiment with these uh, unless you've already tried out the Hummingbird and you wanna just play around with it after you've already 
we trained it and had success. Then the beak tip, we're gonna hook that up. So we just take this beak tip and we drag it down into here. So now this agent will know where the position of its beak tip is. And then we need an agent camera. So we're gonna create a new camera in here and we're gonna create a camera. And this camera needs to be positioned so that we can see. Unfortunately, right now, the camera is so far in front of the bird that you have no real frame of reference of where you are. Um, if there was a flower right in front of it, the camera wouldn't even see it. So we need to change a couple things. So we need to change the position. So the position that I did that worked for me was zero, 0, 0.02 for the Y, and then for the Z, negative 0.03, okay? So uh, we'll be, <laughs> you still can't see anything, but we'll get there. You need to change the clipping planes here from 0.3, which is 30 centimeters, to 0 0.01, which is one centimeter. So now we're able to actually see pretty well. And then probably want to turn off the audio listener. Um, if you have multiple of these in a scene and they're on, then you're going to get error messages. If you add sounds to this project later, then you can turn it back on for the main agent, but uh, we're just going to turn it off for now. And then we're going to actually disable this camera for now. This is not going to be used during training, so we, we're not going to have it on. And so we can go back to the Hummingbird agent and we can hook up this camera we can drag this into here and then we want to turn on training mode by default we'll turn it off when it's time to make our actual game and then we're going to add a decision requester this is very important the decision requester is the only thing that's going to make your agent do anything it is a script that automatically tells the agent to make a decision every five steps in this case you can change this number if you want but five steps is a pretty good Good number for what I've seen and it takes actions between those decisions so what it does is it observes the environment every five steps uh, out of these 5,000 and then it takes a an action every step so it will apply the same action five times in a row and then it will make a new decision and do that same action five times in a row and that may seem weird to you compared to how you play a game but if you think about how long you would hold down for example the forward key you would probably hold it down for more than you know a fraction of a second for more than 0 0.02 seconds so um, if we're doing this for 0.1 seconds then it makes more sense you you probably don't need it to be making a decision every 0 0.02 seconds so that's what that's for and if you don't have a decision requester then your agent will just sit there doing nothing I've made this mistake many times which is why I'm I keep saying don't forget the decision requester all right um, so it seems like that's configuration window it's a core part of everything. If you do not set it correctly, the agent will not do the training properly. And it seems like the Unity have somehow wrapped everything for you. So you don't have to, or you, yeah, you, you don't have to use Python to um, make those stuff anymore. You could do it all inside of the C Sharp programming language. In this video, we're going to set up ray perception. So we already have some observations happening. We already get those from the script. The collect observations, it does observe things like the current rotation and where the flower is. But what it doesn't do is give us any knowledge of the actual scene. And we would like to know at least a little bit of information about how far away the floor is and how far away the nearest object is that this can collide with. And we can do that with ray perception. So we're going to make this using child components. So right here, see how it says use child sensors and it's checked. What that does is it checks through all of the direct children of this agent class and it tries to find sensors on them. So we're going to create an empty and we're going to rename this to raise forward and we're going to add a component called ray perception sensor 3d and now you see that it has these rays coming off of it okay so these rays are sort of like lidar they basically shoot out in a direction and then report back on if they hit anything solid. So that is that is what we're doing with these ray perception sensors. We're gonna create a couple of them. So let's position this first one at zero 
0.005 and 0.02 and what that does is it places it just above the beak here. We don't necessarily want it inside of the beak or inside of the head because it's possible that it could collide with the agent itself and then it would report back that it hit something but it would actually just be hitting itself. So that's something you want to make sure you're avoiding. We're going to rename this the sensor name to raise forward as well. It doesn't really matter what you call these as long as the three different ones that we make are all different names. Then you need to update the detectable tags. We're going to have two detectable tags. The first one is actually untagged and the second one is boundary. And this matches the tags that we have in our project settings and on objects that we want to see. So this can only see things that don't have a tag on them, like bushes and the tree and the rocks, and things that are tagged as boundary, which is just that big cylinder that sort of surrounds the whole thing with six sides. Then we need to update the raise or the let's see, raise per direction should be three. That's good. Then our max ray degrees, we're gonna change this to 60. But I want to show you really quick what this does. So I'm gonna turn off auto save because it keeps trying to save on me every single time I change anything. Um, what this does is it sort of changes how far it can see in any direction. What this does is it decides how many rays in each direction to go. So if we do one, it's only going to have this one and then one to either side. If we do zero, it's only straight ahead. If we do three, it's going to create a total of seven. So three on each side, one in the center. We're going to set this one back to 60. Now, this is convenient, actually, that it's kind of malfunctioning. Um, it thinks it's hit something here. I'm not sure why, but in the case where it hits something, it shows this sort of debug sphere, which shows that this is actually doing a sphere cast currently. And if the sphere hits anything, then it's going to report back. We don't want to do a sphere cast. We're just going to do a ray cast. So if this straight line hits anything, the spheres they just get a little complicated because there is uh, we have very small objects in our scene and so it would be very easy for us to hit a flower with a with a sphere and so it's just easier to do a, a sphere cast radius of zero our ray length should be kept to 20 and then we should be able to leave everything else the same. So this is the first ray perception. Now we want to do a couple more here. So we're going to duplicate this and we're going to rename this to rays up. Oh, actually, no, ray up. And what ray up is going to do is we want it to point straight up. So we're going to do a rotation of negative 90. Okay, so now you're gonna see that it's pointing straight up in the air. Uh, we're only gonna give it one. So we're gonna set it so that it can see straight up. And then we just have to make sure that everything else is set properly. We need, we do need to rename this to ray up so that it doesn't have a conflict with the other one. Um, otherwise, this should be good. Then we need to do Actually, let's just be extra sure. Uh, we probably don't want to say, let's see, raise per direction. Sorry, I'm just making sure that I didn't miss something here. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna duplicate this and we're gonna make this one ray down. And ray down, in case you didn't guess, is gonna point down. So we want it to be positive 90 degree rotation and that's gonna point straight down. Um, this one actually might be a problem if we leave it right here. We don't want it to collide with the beak itself. So we need to set the Y position to negative 0 0.005 and that will make sure that it's pointing, it starts below the beak. And then we just change this to ray down and we have our three different ray casts or ray perception sensors set up. So we have the forward, we have the up, and we have the down. And when this is playing in the game, you'll be able to see these things actively working in real time and hitting things, and they'll turn red when they hit things. So um, that's how these work. They're all hooked up automatically because we have the Hummingbird agent's behavior parameters set to use child sensors. And if you, like me, unchecked this autosave thing, make sure you save it and probably want to turn that back on so that any changes you make in the future are automatically saved. All right, so uh, the ray perception is very important for uh, for this case because he didn't want to use uh, the image graph as an uh, input for his neural network, but he using the ray, uh, the, the ray line as the perception or as the input for the neural network. If we use this kind of thing, the input size would be much more smaller, so we could do the processing with the CPU only. So we don't have 
already use the uh, GPU to do the processing. Yeah, I start to rendering when we could get started to do the training. I really want to do that training. In this video, we are going to test out our hummingbird and the flowers. So the first thing we'll do is take a look at the island. And I just want to show you what you maybe already saw. But this bird has its ray perception now hitting things. You can see what it's hitting. So if you click on the floating island, you'll see the boundaries. And you'll see that these spheres, these are little indicators. They don't mean that there's actually a sphere cast happening, but um, that they're hitting things. So it's hitting this bush and this bush and this wall. It's hitting the ground and then also the ceiling, which is pretty cool. Now we're going to do a test here and we have to modify the hummingbird slightly in order to do this test. I don't want you to make permanent changes. So make sure you're in the scene view, that you're not inside of the prefab, uh, and then we're going to modify the hummingbird. So first thing we'll do is set the behavior type from default to heuristic. And what this does is it tells the agent to always use, inside of the hummingbird agent, always use the uh, heuristic. Let's see, where are we? Heuristic. So it's always going to use this function for its input. So that means that you can control it with W, A, S, and D for the forward, backward, left, left and right. You can go up and down by pressing E and C, and you can pitch with the arrow keys, uh, pitch and turn left and right with the arrow keys. So I know that, you know, that's kind of maybe a lot to, to take in, but hopefully um, after a little bit of practice, you can figure out how to control this thing. And then we also need to set the, make sure that this camera is turned on. So we don't have code yet that automatically turns this camera on. That's going to happen um, once we implement the rest of the game, the mini game portion of this course. So just turn on the camera for now. And then I also wanna point out, make sure that you're still in training mode because we have a line inside of our agent that if it's not training mode, then we don't want to reset the flowers. And so this part will cause problems. If we don't reset the flowers when, it, when an episode begins, then there's problems. Problems. So let's just leave it in training mode for now. And then you should be able to press play. And now I'm able to control my hummingbird. So if I move forward into this flower, then it turns this sort of purple color. I can turn and look up and down and I can move up, fly around. Let's see, it's really hard to control. I realize that, but <laughs> I just wanted to show you the basics of how you could hook up uh, player input for this game. Uh, so I'm going to find another one, and then I'll go into that one, and eventually it's going to reset on me. So we'll just stick around for that. Um, I think it's probably going to take about 30 seconds for it to reset, so I'm going to keep trying to fly in here. Particularly difficult to do with these controls. So I think there's room for improvement with gamepad input, um, potentially some sort of like auto aim feature that could help quite a bit. And you can see that if you take your beak out too soon, then it won't fully remove all of the nectar from the flower. And the game that we'll be playing is basically to compete with an ML agent version of the hummingbird later and see if you can manage to get flowers faster than the ML agent. And uh, in my case, that answer was a definite no. So, okay, so it, it reset and we didn't see any error messages, at least in my run here. I will say, if you do happen to see error messages, keep an eye on this console. This first one right here couldn't connect to trainer on port 5004 using API version 1.0.0, will perform inference instead. This you should expect this to happen. Um, this is not an error. This is just telling us that there's no trainer. There's no Python trainer that's hooked up to it at this point. So what it's going to do is default to trying to use a an N model or a neural network, which means I'm going to stop playing this game. Uh, what it means is it's going to look for something inside of here. And if there's nothing in there, it's not going to work unless you set it to heuristic only, and then it should work. So uh, now that you've tried it out, hopefully you didn't have any errors. If you do have errors, I would recommend you take a look at the red errors. Um, all right, maybe the next part is the training part. In this video, I'm going to give you an overview of training ML agents. We're looking at the documentation page on the Unity ML agents GitHub. This page is called training-ml-agents.md if you're looking for it. This file tells you a lot about what you need to know for training, but you don't need to read it to follow along with this course. I just wanted to draw your attention to it in case you wanted to explore and do more complex training or do different parameters or 
even if maybe the training command changes between now that when I'm recording this material and when you get to it, it's possible that this training command has changed and you just need to know how it works. So uh, check out the documentation for this. That should help quite a bit. Now, training works via a Python command. And the Python command, as this documentation says, is powered by a dedicated Python package, ML agents. And the package exposes a command, ML agents learn that is the single entry point for all training workflows. So what this means is anytime you're training an agent, you're going to run this mlagents-learn command. And that implementation is in this mlagents slash mlagents slash trainers slash learn.py. So it's a Python script that you're running. And this Python script, I have this open right here, is, that's just that file that I was just talking about. This is the code that starts out training. So you don't need to modify this unless you want to for some reason, but it's here if you want to understand it and understand what's happening behind the scenes and what makes things train. And if you start getting error messages, you could start digging in here if you're looking for solutions. So this that I was showing right at the beginning, you'll recognize this in a, in a bit when we start doing training, you're gonna see this logo. This is printed to the console as part of the running of this command. So that should help you sort of conceptualize how training is working. Now, because it's a Python command, that means you need to have a Python environment set up on your machine. And if you're on Mac OS or Linux, it's quite a bit easier to work with Python in my experience, uh, though it can still get a little complicated, especially if, if you have multiple different versions of packages installed or multiple versions of Python, it can get pretty messy. Um, and absolutely on Windows, you want something to help you manage it. And that's why in this course, we're using Anaconda. So Anaconda is a Python environment manager. It helps you manage different versions of Python and different packages that are installed for different things and just helps you keep things clean. So that's what I recommend as we move forward. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to install that. If you are already familiar with how to set up Python and you're pretty confident, then you can, and you don't want to install Anaconda because you know what you're doing, then by all means, skip it. All the commands that I run in the Anaconda window will probably make sense to you uh, just in the context outside of all right, Anaconda. All right, all right, all uh, right, stop talking. I, I, I'm already know how to um, use Python and how to set it up. I was kind of an expert on it. So skip it. We will just get into the configure YAML. In this video, we're going to talk about the trainerconfig.yaml file. Trainerconfig.yaml is an essential file for running training with Python for ML agents. So I want you to find the trainer underscore config.yaml file that should be included in the downloadable source code for this course. And I want you to put it into a new folder on your computer, somewhere that you definitely have permission to modify files files and all that. So mine's just in my documents under a few other folders. Mine is called MLA-1.0. So this trainer config.yaml file contains information that the neural network and the training code needs to train our ML agents. So I'm going to open it up and this is trainer underscore config.yaml. I have this open in Visual Studio code if you haven't seen this before. Uh, it's a nice text editor, but you can open it with any other text editor if you like. And a YAML file, just so that you know, I think it stands for yet another markdown language. So it's similar to JSON or even kind of similar to HTML. It's just a format for how to put data into a text file. So don't worry, you don't need to like learn a new coding language or something to understand this. It's basically just a list of parameters. So we have something called default here. This is the default list of parameters that are used to set up your neural network work and train it with ML agents. So we start off with trainer PPO, and then we have something called batch size, beta, buffer size. There's a lot going on here, and it, I don't think it would be helpful for me to explain what every single one of these does because you'd forget it and it would be overwhelming. But what you should know is that we're going to override some of these parameters to fit our agent better so that it will train better than just the default parameters. And if you're interested in knowing more about what these parameters do, you can go to the GitHub page for Unity ML Agents, and then you need to find the documentation. So I'm going to make sure that I'm in the release branch for this. Um, there's a release one branch currently. Now this could go away by the time you see this, but I'm just making sure that I'm on this release one branch because I want to make sure that the documentation is the correct version for the version of ML Agents that I'm using. Under docs and then training configuration file, there's information about what's inside of this file. So it shows you 
you the common trainer configurations and it explains all of these different commands or all of these different options that you have hidden units uh, num layers those are two of the big ones that's basically describing how big your neural network is how deep it is and how many neurons it should have um, there's things like we're going to be editing the time horizon um, let's just take a quick look at some of these that we're modifying so that you have a sense of what's changing the time horizon here 128 this one is I'm not going to read this whole thing but essentially I think this is the most important sentence this number should be large enough to capture all the important behavior within a sequence of an agent's actions so my understanding is that this is in steps and so I wanted to make sure that we had enough steps to capture a hummingbird successfully flying to a flower and then drinking from it for a couple of seconds before it sort of saved that experience off and then batch size and buffer size that has to do with how many of these things we learn on at a time and then hidden units is how complex our neural network is the default hidden unit is 128 so I'm basically just doubling that so we're gonna have a more complex neural network because this is a more complex task than some of the default projects that are built in here and then max step uh, that is the maximum number of steps all right, all right. That um, it's kind of boring I don't want to say it so let's go to the next part training preparation in this video we're going to set up our scene for training as well as talk about the ml agents learn python command so the first thing we're going to do is make sure that we have our training scene open if you don't have it open then you might not have enough time to initiate the starting of training so you do want to make sure that this is open before you run the training command but we're also going to do one other thing here and that is to duplicate the floating island eight times well technically we're duplicating it seven times we are going to right click on this and duplicate and then I want you to move this in the Z direction by 30 meters so that we have a second one and then we're gonna duplicate again and then we can move these in the X by 30 and then we can select them again duplicate and we're gonna do this to 60 and then finally we're gonna duplicate it one more time and you can do 90 so now we have eight of these areas that can train simultaneously this scene isn't so complex that we can't train with so many with all of these at the same time if you had a really complex scene it might be harder to do a bunch of them at the same time so you'll just have to experiment and see what works with your machine if it looks like it's really choppy and really sluggish then maybe the number of areas that you've that you're training with is too many and you want to train with six or four or something like that it really will depend on your computer's ability to train all of these at the same time and since we're training with the CPU instead of the GPU uh, it probably has more to do with how good your processor is than your uh, GPU though the GPU might be a factor as well I I'm not an expert on you know system configurations so that will maybe take some experimentation so we have these eight different islands here and we're going to start training uh, make sure you save this anytime you see that asterisk you want to control s to save it and then open up your anaconda prompt and we want to navigate into that folder where the trainer config.yaml file is. So for me, I have to do cd to change directory into my documents, code, ml agents, MLA-1.0. So now I'm in the folder that I have my trainer config YAML file in. And I also want to point out, since I forgot to mention this before, inside your trainer config.yaml, you do want to double check that this is exactly the same as inside your inside your hummingbird, the behavior name. Make sure that the spelling is right and that you have the capitalization the same because it will match up this behavior name with this inside trainer config and if it doesn't find it it'll just go with the defaults so be aware of that so back to this we're going to test out the ml agents learn command now to make sure that it works so i want you to type in m l a g e n t s dash l e a r n so ml agents learn and then do dash h and this is going to run the command and pull up its help documentation so hopefully this worked uh, if you get error messages that say that the command doesn't exist or wasn't recognized go back to the installation instructions and make sure you did the pip install for ml agents correctly um, that's generally what that means if you get an error message at the top that says something about uh, CUDA RT64 uh, DLLs not being found I've found that I can safely ignore that and it doesn't seem to affect the quality of training or anything I get a few warning messages here and there but other than that it's 
doesn't seem to be a big problem. And then under here, you have the usage instructions. So there's a bunch of different commands you can plug in here. We actually don't need most of them for what we're going to do, but it's good to know that they exist. For example, you can change the time scale. So by default, the time scale is 20. And let me see if it shows that here. Um, yeah, default is 20. So you can actually run this faster or slower if you like. Um, you can also change a bunch of different things about frame rates and whether to use CPU or not. There's lots of different things you can do. So feel free to look through those uh, if you want to understand what's going on, but we'll just be running a pretty simple command here. So as long as you have this working, that's a good sign. In the next video, we'll actually run the ML Agents Learn command. Let's get a start here. Let's get into the next one because I think that uh, we have spent so many time on this series of videos and we even didn't get started yet. So this is generally the process when you uh, want to do some machine learning stuff. The training is just one part of that. But before the training, you had to do a lot of coding and environment to set it up for your training. So um, I don't know. It's also a, a tedious work. Um, it depends on how you say it. Um, but I guess for modern society and, and for modern industry, uh, there won't have just one person who doing all those stuffs by himself, but instead there will have a lot of people. They are working on the same project and each one, each person inside of that team will only do one part of the, the, the process. In this video, we're going to run the training command and start training. So the first thing I want you to do is make sure that you have your Anaconda prompt open and that you are in the right environment so that the ML agents commands will work. Then I want you to open up the project, make sure that you have your training scene ready to go, that you have eight of these floating islands ready for training and save the scene. And then we wanna also just double check, go in here. This is kind of a gotcha that a lot of students that I've worked with in the past have, have gotten stuck on. Make sure that your agent, the hummingbird here, is set to behavior type default. If this is set to heuristic only, then training will not work. And sometimes um, you might just want to double check and make sure that all of them are set to default, just in case some weird things can happen. If you modify one and then there's one in here that's not training, it can be kind of a mess. So that's important. And then for this project in particular, make sure that training mode is checked on because we wrote some special code that only happens when training mode is on. And then also make sure you have this decision requester, because if you don't have a decision requester, then no decisions will be made and nothing will work either. So those are some of the most common gotchas that I've seen in the past. So I just wanted to address those up front. So now you can open up your Anaconda prompt again. And the command we want is M-L-A-G-E-N-T-S. So ML agents, and then a hyphen or a dash, L-E-A-R-N. So ML agents dash learn is the command. And then the first parameter is you can do a dot slash trainer and then if you hit tab it should autocomplete trainer underscore config dot yaml because we have this file inside of the directory that we're currently working in. So the first command is always that trainer config yaml and then after that you can add the other parameters. Now in our case we only need one other parameter and that is dash dash run dash ID and then a space and then we need to specify what our run ID is. So ours is going to be HB underscore zero one and I always like to do a zero one at the end because I tend to train more than 10 different <laughs> runs and so having just the ability to go all the way up to 99 training runs gives me some extra breathing room. Once this is typed in, you should be able to hit enter and you might see some warning errors about CUDA, um, probably safe to ignore. Maybe something's not working properly on my machine, but I am still able to train. So um, hopefully yours is the same. And the most important thing that you'll see here is listening on port 5004, start training by pressing pl the play button in the Unity editor. So once you you see this you have a limited amount of time before you can go to unity and press play now in my case I intentionally made a mistake here because I wanted to show you what can happen so I did almost everything right except I had highlighted or clicked in this area if that happens it will freeze up the script in anaconda so you just have to hit enter and it will resume where it was and then I see this 
blue play button, meaning that it worked. And I see a bunch of error messages that are, in my experience, safe to ignore. Um, I don't know why there are so many error messages. Maybe it's something to do with how I installed TensorFlow or something, but it seems to be working for me. So once it's been training for at least 10,000 steps, which takes about a minute on my machine, then you're going to start seeing these updates. So HB underscore zero one, Hummingbird, step 10,000, time elapsed, 66.119 seconds, and then a mean reward of 0.0. .0. So we'll talk more about this in the next video. Ah, finally, uh, we are ready in the training. It's good. So let's um, let's watch more. I just want to know. I am just curious about uh, what the result could be or what the training process looks like. In this video, we're going to talk about the training. So I've allowed the time to continue for a little bit here. We have a few at the beginning that are just a mean reward of 0.0. .0. So what's interesting after that is it goes negative. So if you remember, we wrote the code so that if the hummingbirds run into the boundary to the outside, of the area actually let me just show that to you and in the event that this was maximized i just want to show you you can right click on this and you can click this maximize thing now we can go to the scene view and if you click on the island boundaries for one of these and assuming that you have the gizmos button checked then you should be able to see these boundaries when it first started out these hummingbirds were just taking random actions in the scene and they weren't getting high enough to actually hit the boundaries of the area but once they started getting a little bit more curious they sort of explored beyond where the, we wanted them to go and started hitting the boundaries. And so that's why you start seeing these negative numbers here as the average reward that each of these hummingbirds is getting over time because they're actually hitting the boundaries. Now, it might be a while before you see some positive numbers here, but we do actually have a positive number here. I'm gonna highlight this and I'll show you that it actually freezes training again, um, or at least it freezes this part. If I hit enter, I should be able to hit enter and then it'll continue. Um, um, it may be negative for quite a while, but over time, this number should get higher and higher. We're going to get closer to zero for a while just because the birds are going to figure out that they shouldn't be running into the walls, and then eventually they'll learn that they need to be getting into these flowers. Now, you can see here we have the hummingbird kind of taking these random actions, but slowly learning that he should not be running into the walls. Um, the green line points to the nearest flower. That's to the one that we picked for him when he was closest to a flower at the beginning. And then you can see actually right here, this purple one indicates that this one managed to get that flower. And that probably means that he's starting to learn that if he's if he spawns right in front of a flower, then all he has to do is just move forward, because that's probably the simplest case that he can possibly have. In this case, it was spawned much further away, and so it took some time for him to time out, but he never actually found the flower. Now, you may notice that these are moving kind of fast, and it doesn't seem like they have that much time to run. Well, that's because it's running at 20x speed. So we can go into the project settings. And if you don't have the tab open already, you can go into edit project settings and it's automatically set to 20. We can change this to one and it doesn't doesn't seem to hurt training, at least if you do it for a short period of time. Um, and now we can see it at normal speed. So not doing great, but you can see that it, it definitely has plenty of time to find a few flowers before it resets on it. So um, this can be helpful for debugging what's going on with your agents if they don't seem to be working properly or don't seem to be learning. I often will run them at a time scale of one to see if something isn't working right or if they're getting stuck or something like that. So once you've looked at this and you're comfortable with, you know, the fact that they seem to be working all right, then you can switch it back to a time scale of 20. Um, you can even experiment with higher if you want, though I wouldn't recommend it. Um, just seems like 20 is a pretty safe number for not going overboard with, with performance issues. Okay, so we're going to just keep letting this train for a while, and it might not really pick up for a good 20, 30 minutes or so. Just be aware of that. Um, in the next video, we're going to talk about TensorBoard, which is a different way of looking at these numbers. Nice. So in the end, um, the Unity a AI agent is indeed have found a way to has has a way to actually connect the Python script with um, with himself, and what he is using as a TensorFlow at the lower level, and that was good because um, the TensorFlow and TensorFlow dot is the only machine learning libraries that we really know, you know, back to before we have spent so many time on the uh, on, on this library for the machine learning. 
In this video, we're going to look at TensorBoard. For this to work, we need a second Anaconda prompt open. We can't do it in this same one. So on Windows, all you have to do is right click on this and you can click on Anaconda prompt and it will open another one. Now you'll notice here on the side, it says base and that means that we're not in the environment that we need to be in. So we can run Conda ENV list and it will show us our list of Conda environments. And I'm going to do Conda activate and the one I want is my ml agents 1.0. I'm going to right click to copy that to the clipboard and then right click to paste it. And now I'm in the ML agents environment. You can tell by the parentheses. I need to move into the directory that my that I set up for training. And I'll show you that directory now. It has some new stuff in it. So the MLA-1.0, that's where I want to be. It now has a models and a summaries folder in it. So summaries is where the tensor board data is. And essentially it's a CSV file and then some TensorFlow event file or something something. I don't really know what these are and I'm, I'm not sure that you need to really know anything beyond that TensorBoard is able to open them. So TensorBoard came installed when you installed ML agents with pip so it should just work but we need to be in the right folder so I'm going to cd just into that directory. Let's see documents code where did I put it ML agents MLA 1.0 and then TensorBoard dash dash log dir so l o g d i r and then you have to pass in that summaries so that'll tell it look inside this folder and hit enter and i got my cuda rt64 errors again but should be okay um, i want this localhost colon 6006 so you should be able to do that in your browser so i'm going to open firefox this is one that seems to work well for me uh, localhost colon 6006 whoops did that wrong let's try that again okay so this is our training run visualized in graph form so this is actually the exact same as this so see the most recent one we got was 0.724. If we hover over this, then should be about the same, but let's see, 480K, 480K. Okay, 6.636. It just hadn't quite gotten there yet. So 0.63, I don't know, seems pretty close. I'm not sure why it's not exactly the same. I think I'm having a hard time matching it up um, exactly, but this is roughly the same, we'll say. I think it maybe it takes snapshots at different points than, than this. Um, exactly how this is calculated versus this isn't really that important. So TensorBoard, you have right in the top left this handy cumulative reward graph, and this shows how well your agents are doing over time. You can. All right, uh, the TensorBoard, the TensorBoard is just a software. By using it, you could view the statistics about the training process of your um, machine learning model, and of course, you can check all of that inside of a local host website. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, we're gonna go to the next one. In this video, we're going to look at a fully trained agent, and I'll show you how to perform inference. So what you're looking at here is the cumulative reward chart for my agent as it trained all the way through to the maximum step. So really quick, just to show sort of what happened. In the last video, we left off somewhere around here, just as it was starting to pick up. And I let it train for another two hours and 20 minutes. You can see in that black box below the chart on the right hand side, it says two hours, 20 minutes, 27 seconds and you can see that it also trained for up until the five millionth step so the reason that it stopped automatically was because in our trainer config we said to do a max steps of 5.0 e6 so that's five million the default you'll notice here is 500,000 so let's just look really quick if we had stopped at 500,000 it would have stopped right here and it would not have ended up in a successful agent even though that finished in 10 minutes it would have stopped early and you wouldn't have gotten a good result so that's why you definitely definitely want to make sure you give it enough time to properly train before you cut it off early. Now I let it train all the way to the end and it automatically stopped. I could have stopped it early. Let's say I was pretty happy. I could see that it was kind of plateauing somewhere in this range, maybe right here. I still wouldn't be able to tell that it, it had plateaued, but definitely by about 3 million, you can kind of tell that it has plateaued. So in that case, there's a couple ways to stop it. One is in here. I believe you just hit control C and it will stop this training. The other one, which is what I typically 
typically do is in Unity, you just hit the play button and then it will stop training. And then regardless of which way it stops training, you'll see output like this. So you'll have seen the steps continuing to count up and it'll show how much time elapsed in seconds and the mean reward and the standard deviation. And then you'll see saved model and assuming everything worked, which uh, usually it does for me, I, I typically don't have any issues except um, you know, in some weird case where I think I had permissions, uh, like folder permissions issue or something, and I resolved it, and then it, it worked just fine. Uh, all right. So, um, how can we import the n n file? You know, back to before, uh, when I was learning the the machine learning, they do not call the neural network module a dot n n file, but instead they call it a dot h five file. That's a, that's that's kind of different, but. Um, but I think the logic behind it is the same. Called NN models. And inside here, we'd like to put our NN model. So we're going to just click and drag this in. And if you click on this, you can look at some information about the imported file. So the first thing up at the top is inputs. So these are the different observations that get fed into the neural network. And we see that it's negative 1, 1, 1, 46. Basically, what this means is there are 46 observations going into this neural network. And we know from our hummingbird that we have a vector observation size of 10. So there's 36 different inputs that we haven't that aren't accounted for here and those i'm going to open up the hummingbird uh, prefab here those actually are these child sensors that are automatically being imported so because there are three of these different ones the total amount of observations coming from these must add up to 36 and i know it has something to do with the number of tags that you're looking for multiplied by the number of rays so in this case it's three on either side so you have seven times two is 14 um and then there's one for either of these. I, I don't remember all the different ones. If you're curious, you can look into how the code for ray perception sensor 3D works, but that's where that number's coming from. And then the other one that was in here was this outputs. So this is the action shape and action probability, and this must correspond to the different actions that it can take, which are these five different actions it can take. And then what you'll wanna do is pull this hummingbird model into this model field. Mine's showing up automatically because I I had already done it. I um, I was just testing it out earlier. You want to click and drag this into this field, and then it will show up there, and it will also start using it anytime that it's not set to heuristic only. So as long as it's set to default or it's set to inference only, then it'll use this model that's in this field. Then we can hop back out to here, and as long as you haven't modified your hummingbird at all in the main scene, it should automatically populate this NN model, and we can click play. And you won't be able to see anything. Well, you can kind of see them. It's really small but he's he's in the background so I'm going to get out of this game tab and go to the scene view and then I'm gonna find him so there he is the hummingbird is trying to find flowers and seems to be succeeding so that's pretty exciting to see because it's not connected to the Python at all at this point like this this is not running so it's not training it's purely using this NN model inside of unity and if I turn on the gizmos and I have the hummingbird selected you can see the observations that it's doing so it's seeing things that are in front of it so it can avoid collisions and it's uh, just going about doing its business and it'll keep doing this for as long as you let it eventually if you let it go indefinitely it would probably collect every single flower on this unless it got stuck somewhere um, which sometimes it will get stuck but in general I found that it seems to work pretty well so that's pretty exciting uh, that is inference and the most exciting thing aside from the fact that it works at all in my opinion is that you can include these NN files in a built project of Unity. So once you've trained it and you've imported this file, when you build your executable or your app, then it should be included and work on the platform when you play the game outside of the Unity editor. All right, so um, let's say, I must say that uh, this is very exciting you know, for us to do uh, because finally we know we are doing the training with Python, but after we did that training, we will get the neural network file. And then we could use that file without the Python and without the Unity editor, and we could compile it into an APK file or a mobile application or desktop application, whatever you call it. But in the end, we could offer or we could deliver our application to the end users, to, to everyone um, in this earth or on this earth. So 
that everyone could uh, have a chance to uh, try our application. And that's really cool because we could use it to, to do some awesome stuff. For example, automate, automate, automation or uh, something like that. For example, uh, automatic driving car. I guess everyone of you already heard about this and it's, it's not a dream anymore. It's a reality for now and it's making a lot of money especially if you ever heard about a company called tesla i don't know if you ever heard about this company or not but it's making a lot of money by doing the automatic driving car all right i think this is the end almost uh, for everything and inside of this service we have learned about how to do the machine learning with uh, Unity and with Python. And it's quite exciting for us to do this, except that along that process, we have to do, we have to do a lot of not that cool process. I mean, you have to do those preparation for the training, but it's not a problem after we see the outcome that we could get from the whole process. And it's really, let's say, it's a really excited field for us to get in. So I think this is it. I'm your friend in Saxo, and if you love my channel, please subscribe and hit the thumb up button. And that's it. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.